Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 11 Mr. Barbecue Smith was gone. The motor had whirled him away to the station. A faint smell of burning oil commemorated his recent departure. A considerable detachment had come into the courtyard to speed him on his way. And now they were walking back round the side of the house towards the terrace and the garden. They walked in silence. Nobody had yet ventured to comment on the departed guest. "'Well,' said Anne at last, turning with raised inquiring eyebrows to Dennis. "'Well, it was time for someone to begin.' Dennis declined the invitation. He passed it on to Mr. Scogan. "'Well,' he said. Mr. Scogan did not respond. He only repeated the question. "'Well?' It was left for Henry Wimbush to make a pronouncement. "'A very agreeable adjunct to the weekend,' he said. His tone was obituary. They had descended, without paying much attention to where they were going, the steep yew-walk that went down under the flank of the terrace to the pool. The house towered above them immensely tall, with the whole height of the built-up terrace added to its own seventy feet of brick façade. The perpendicular lines of the three towers soared up uninterrupted, enhancing the impression of height until it became overwhelming. They paused at the edge of the pool to look back. "'The man who built this house knew his business,' said Dennis. "'He was an architect.' "'Was he?' said Henry Wimbush reflectively. "'I doubt it. The builder of this house was Sir Ferdinando Lapith, who flourished during the reign of Elizabeth. He inherited the estate from his father— to whom it had been granted at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. For Crome was originally a cloister of monks, and this swimming pool their fish pond. Sir Ferdinando was not content merely to adapt the old monastic buildings to his own purposes, but using them as a stone quarry for his barns and byres and outhouses, he built for himself a grand new house of brick, the house you see now. He waved his hand in the direction of the house and was silent. Severe, imposing, almost menacing, Crome loomed down on them. "'The great thing about Crome,' said Mr. Scogan, seizing the opportunity to speak, "'is the fact that it's so unmistakably and aggressively a work of art. "'It makes no compromise with nature, but affronts it and rebels against it. "'It has no likeness to Shelley's tower in the Epipsychidium, "'which, if I remember rightly, seems not now a work of human art, "'but as it were titanic, in the heart of earth having assumed its form,' and grown out of the mountain from the living stone, lifting itself in caverns light and high. No, no, there isn't any nonsense of that sort about Crome. That the hovels of the peasantry should look as though they had grown out of the earth, to which their inmates are attached, is right, no doubt, and suitable. But the house of an intelligent, civilised, and sophisticated man should never seem to have sprouted from the clods. It should rather be an expression of his grand, unnatural remoteness from the cloddish life. Since the days of William Morris, that's a fact which we in England have been unable to comprehend. Civilised and sophisticated men have solemnly played at being peasants. Hence quaintness, arts and crafts, cottage architecture, and all the rest of it. In the suburbs of our cities you may see, reduplicated in endless rows, studiedly quaint imitations and adaptations of the village hovel. Poverty, ignorance, and a limited range of materials produce the hovel, which possesses undoubtedly, in suitable surroundings, its own, as it were, titanic charm. We now employ our wealth, our technical knowledge, our rich variety of materials, for the purpose of building millions of imitation hovels in totally unsuitable surroundings. Could imbecility go further? Henry Wimbush took up the thread of his interrupted discourse. "'All that you say, my dear Scogan,' he began, "'is certainly very just, very true.' but whether Sir Ferdinando shared your views about architecture, or if, indeed, he had any views about architecture at all, I very much doubt. In building this house, Sir Ferdinando was, as a matter of fact, preoccupied by only one thought, the proper placing of his privies. Sanitation was the one great interest of his life. In 1573 he even published on this subject a little book, now extremely scarce, called certain privy councils by one of her majesty's most honourable privy councils f l knight 
in which the whole matter is treated with great learning and elegance. His guiding principle in arranging the sanitation of a house was to secure that the greatest possible distance should separate the privy from the sewage arrangements. Hence it followed inevitably that the privies were to be placed at the top of the house, being connected by vertical shafts with pits or channels in the ground. It must not be thought that Sir Ferdinando was moved only by material and merely sanitary considerations, for the placing of his privies in an exalted position he had also certain excellent spiritual reasons, for, he argues in the third chapter of his privy councils, the necessities of nature are so base and brutish that in obeying them we are apt to forget that we are the noblest creatures of the universe. To counteract these degrading effects he advised that the privy should be in every house the room nearest to heaven that it should be well provided with windows, commanding an extensive and noble prospect, and that the walls of the chamber should be lined with bookshelves containing all the ripest products of human wisdom, such as the Proverbs of Solomon, Beatius's Consolations of Philosophy, the Apothems of Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, the Enchiridion of Erasmus, and all other works, ancient or modern, which testify to the nobility of the human soul. In Crome he was able to put his theories into practice. At the top of each of the three projecting towers he placed a privy. From these a shaft went down the whole height of the house, that is to say more than seventy feet, through the cellars, and into a series of conduits provided with flowing water, tunnelled in the ground on a level with the base of the raised terrace. These conduits emptied themselves into the stream several hundred yards below the fish-pond. The total depth of the shafts, from the top of the towers to their subterranean conduits, was a hundred and two feet. The eighteenth century, with its passion for modernization, swept away these monuments of sanitary ingenuity. Were it not for tradition and the explicit account of them left by Sir Ferdinando, we should be unaware that these noble privies had ever existed. We should even suppose that Sir Ferdinando built his house after this strange and splendid model for merely aesthetic reasons. The contemplation of the glories of the past always evoked in Henry Wimbush a certain enthusiasm. Under the grey bowler his face worked and glowed as he spoke. The thought of these vanished privies moved him profoundly. He ceased to speak. The light gradually died out of his face, and it became once more the replica of the grave, polite hat which shaded it. There was a long silence, the same, gently melancholy thoughts seemed to possess the mind of each of them. Permanence, transience. Sir Ferdinando and his privies were gone. Crome still stood. How brightly the sun shone, and how inevitable was death! The ways of God were strange, the ways of men were stranger still. "'It does one's heart good,' exclaimed Mr. Scogan at last, "'to hear of these fantastic English aristocrats.' to have a theory about privies, and to build an immense and splendid house in order to put it into practice. It's magnificent, beautiful. I like to think of them all, the eccentric milords rolling across Europe in ponderous carriages, bound on extraordinary errands. One is going to Venice to buy La Bianchi's larynx. He won't get it till she's dead, of course, but no matter, he's prepared to wait. He has a collection, pickled in glass bottles, of the throats of famous opera singers and the instruments of renowned virtuosi, he goes in for them too. He will try to bribe Paganini to part with his little Guarnerio, but he has small hope of success. Paganini won't sell his fiddle, but perhaps he might sacrifice one of his guitars. Others are bound on crusades, one to die miserably among the savage Greeks, another in his white top hat to lead Italians against their oppressors. Others have no business at all. They are just giving their oddity a continental airing. At home they cultivate themselves at leisure and with greater elaboration. Beckford builds towers, Portland digs holes in the ground, Cavendish, the millionaire, lives in a stable, eats nothing but mutton, and amuses himself, oh, solely for his private delectation, by anticipating the electrical discoveries of half a century. Glorious eccentrics. Every age is enlivened by their presence. Some day, my dear Dennis, said Mr. Scogan, turning a beady, bright regard in his direction, some day you must become their biographer. The lives of queer men, what a subject! I should like to undertake it myself. Mr. Scogan paused, looked up once more at the towering house, then murmured the word eccentricity, 
two or three times. Eccentricity. It's the justification of all aristocracies. It justifies leisured classes, and inherited wealth, and privilege, and endowments, and all the other injustices of that sort. If you're to do anything reasonable in this world, you must have a class of people who are secure, safe from public opinion, safe from poverty, leisured, not compelled to waste their time in the imbecile routines that go by the name of honest work. You must have a class of which the members can think and, within the obvious limits, do what they please. You must have a class in which people who have eccentricities can indulge them, and in which eccentricity in general will be tolerated and understood. That's the important thing about an aristocracy. Not only is it eccentric itself, often grandiosely so, it also tolerates and even encourages eccentricity in others. The eccentricities of the artist and the newfangled thinker don't inspire it with that fear, loathing and disgust which the Burgesses instinctively feel towards them. It is a sort of Red Indian reservation planted in the midst of a vast horde of poor whites, colonials at that. Within its boundaries wild men disport themselves. Often it must be admitted a little grossly, a little too flamboyantly, and when kindred spirits are born outside the pale, it offers them some sort of refuge from the hatred which the poor whites, en bon bourgeois, lavish on anything that is wild or out of the ordinary. After the social revolution, there will be no reservations. The redskins will be drowned in the great sea of poor whites. What then? Will they suffer you to go on writing villanelles, my good Dennis? Will you, unhappy Henry, be allowed to live in this house of the splendid privies, to continue your quiet delving in the mines of futile knowledge? Will Anne, and you, said Anne, interrupting him, will you be allowed to go on talking? You may rest assured, Mr. Scogan replied, that I shall not. I shall have some honest work to do. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 12 Blight, Mildew and Smut Mary was puzzled and distressed. Perhaps her ears had played her false. Perhaps what he had really said was Squire Binion and Shanks, or Child Blunden and Earp, or even Abercrombie, Drinkwater and Rabindranath de Gore. Perhaps but then her ears never did play her false. Blight, mildew, and smut. The impression was distinct and ineffaceable. Blight, mildew. She was forced to the conclusion, reluctantly, that Dennis had indeed pronounced those improbable words. He had deliberately repelled her attempts to open a serious discussion. That was horrible. A man who would not talk seriously to a woman just because she was a woman? Oh, impossible. Egeria or nothing. Perhaps... Gombold would be more satisfactory. True, his meridional heredity was a little disquieting, but at least he was a serious worker, and it was with his work that she should associate herself. And Dennis, after all, what was Dennis? A dilettante, an amateur. Gombold had annexed for his painting-room a little disused granary that stood by itself in a green close beyond the farmyard. It was a square brick building with a peaked roof, and little windows set high up in each of its walls. A ladder of four rungs led up to the door, for the granary was perched above the ground and out of the reach of the rats on four massive toadstools of grey stone. Within there lingered a faint smell of dust and cobwebs, and the narrow shaft of sunlight that came slanting in at every hour of the day through one of the little windows was always alive with silvery motes. Here Gombold worked, with a kind of concentrated ferocity, during six or seven hours of each day. He was pursuing something new, something terrific, if only he could catch it. During the last eight years, nearly half of which had been spent in the process of winning the war, he had worked his way industriously through Cubism. Now he had come out on the other side. He had begun by painting a formalised nature. Then, little by little, he had risen from nature into the world of pure form, till, in the end, he was painting nothing but his own thoughts, externalised in the abstract geometrical forms of the mind's devising. He found the process arduous and exhilarating. And then, 
Quite suddenly he grew dissatisfied. He felt himself cramped and confined within intolerably narrow limitations. He was humiliated to find how few and crude and uninteresting were the forms he could invent. The inventions of nature were without number, inconceivably subtle and elaborate. He had done with cubism. He was out on the other side. But the cubist discipline preserved him from falling into excesses of nature worship. He took from nature its rich, subtle, elaborate forms, but his aim was always to work them into a whole that should have the thrilling simplicity and formality of an idea, to combine prodigious realism with prodigious simplification. Memories of Caravaggio's portentous achievements haunted him. Forms of breathing, living reality emerged from darkness, built themselves up into compositions as luminously simple and single as a mathematical idea. He thought of the call of Matthew, of Peter crucified, of the lute players, of Magdalene. He had the secret, that astonishing ruffian, he had the secret. And now Gombold was after it, in hot pursuit. Yes, it would be something terrific, if only he could catch it. For a long time an idea had been stirring and spreading yeastily in his mind. He had made a portfolio full of studies, he had drawn a cartoon, and now the idea was taking shape on canvas. A man fallen from a horse, the huge animal, a gaunt white cart-horse, filled the upper half of the picture with its great body. Its head, lowered towards the ground, was in shadow. The immense bony body was what arrested the eye, the body and the legs which came down on either side of the picture like the pillars of an arch. On the ground, between the legs of the towering beast, lay the foreshortened figure of a man, the head in the extreme foreground, the arms flung wide to right and left. A white, relentless light poured down from a point in the right foreground. The beast, the fallen man, were sharply illuminated. Round them, beyond and behind them, was the night. They were alone in the darkness, a universe in themselves. The horse's body filled the upper part of the picture. The legs, the great hoofs, frozen to stillness in the midst of their trampling, limited it on either side. And beneath lay the man, his foreshortened face at the focal point in the centre, his arms outstretched towards the sides of the picture. Under the arch of the horse's belly, between his legs, the eye looked through into an intense darkness. Below the space was closed in by the figure of the prostrate man, a central gulf of darkness surrounded by luminous forms. The picture was more than half finished. Gumbel had been at work all morning on the figure of the man, and now he was taking a rest, the time to smoke a cigarette. Tilting back his chair till it touched the wall, he looked thoughtfully at his canvas. He was pleased, and at the same time he was desolated. In itself the thing was good, he knew it, but that something he was after, that something that would be so terrific if only he could catch it. Had he caught it, would he ever catch it? Three little taps, rat-tat-tat. Surprised, Gumbold turned his eyes towards the door. Nobody ever disturbed him while he was at work. It was one of the unwritten laws. Come in, he called. The door, which was ajar, swung open, revealing, from the waist upwards, the form of Mary. She had only dared to mount halfway up the ladder. If he didn't want her, retreat would be easier and more dignified than if she climbed to the top. May I come in? she asked. Certainly. She skipped up the remaining two rungs and was over the threshold in an instant. A letter came for you by second post, she said. I thought it might be important, so I brought it out to you. Her eyes, her childish face, were luminously candid as she handed him the letter. There had never been a flimsier pretext. Gombold looked at the envelope and put it in his pocket unopened. Luckily, he said, it isn't at all important. Thanks very much, all the same. There was a silence. Mary felt a little uncomfortable. May I have a look at what you're painting? she had the courage to say at last. Gombold had only half smoked his cigarette. In any case, he wouldn't begin work again until he had finished. He would give her the five minutes that separated him from the bitter end. This is the best place to see it from, he said. Mary looked at the picture for some time without saying anything. Indeed, she didn't know what to say. She was taken aback. She was at a loss. She had expected a cubist masterpiece, and here was a picture of a man and a horse, not only recognisable as such, but even aggressively in drawing. 
trompe l'oeil there was no other word to describe the delineation of that foreshortened figure under the trampling feet of the horse what was she to think what was she to say her orientations were gone one could admire representationism in the old masters obviously but in a modern at eighteen she might have done so but now after five years of schooling among the best judges her instinctive reaction to a contemporary piece of representation was contempt an outburst of laughing disparagement what could gombold be up to she had felt so safe in admiring his work before but now she didn't know what to think it was very difficult very difficult there's rather a lot of chiaroscuro isn't there she ventured at last and inwardly congratulated herself on having found a critical formula so gentle and at the same time so penetrating there is gumbold agreed mary was pleased he accepted her criticism it was a serious discussion she put her head on one side and screwed up her eyes i think it's awfully fine she said but of course it's a little too too trompe l'oeil for my taste she looked at gombold who made no response but continued to smoke gazing meditatively all the time at his picture mary went on gaspingly when i was in paris this spring i saw a lot of chaplinsky i admire his work so tremendously of course it's frightfully abstract now frightfully abstract and frightfully intellectual he just throws a few oblongs onto his canvas quite flat you know and painted in pure primary colours but his design is wonderful he's getting more and more abstract every day he'd given up the third dimension when i was there and was just thinking of giving up the second soon he says there'll be just a blank canvas that's the logical conclusion complete abstraction painting's finished he's finishing it when he's reached pure abstraction he's going to take up architecture he says it's more intellectual than painting do you agree she asked with a final gasp gombold dropped his cigarette end and trod on it Schaplitsky's finished painting he said i've finished my cigarette but i'm going on painting and advancing towards her he put his arm round her shoulders and turned her round away from the picture mary looked at him her hair swung back a soundless bell of gold her eyes were serene she smiled so the moment had come his arm was round her he moved slowly almost imperceptibly and she moved with him it was a peripatetic embrace do you agree with him she repeated the moment might have come but she would not cease to be intellectual serious i don't know i shall have to think about it gombold loosened his embrace his hand dropped from her shoulder be careful going down the ladder he added solicitously mary looked round startled they were in front of the open door she remained standing there for a moment in bewilderment the hand that had rested on her shoulders made itself felt lower down her back it administered three or four kindly little smacks replying automatically to its stimulus she moved forward be careful going down the ladder said gombold once more she was careful the door closed behind her and she was alone in the little green close she walked slowly back through the farmyard she was pensive end of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 13 Henry Wimbush brought down with him to dinner a budget of printed sheets loosely bound together in a cardboard portfolio. Today, he said, exhibiting it with a certain solemnity, today I have finished the printing of my History of Chrome. I helped to set up the type of the last page this evening. The famous history cried Anne. The writing and printing of this magnum opus had been going on as long as she could remember. All her childhood long, Uncle Henry's history had been a vague and fabulous thing, often heard of and never seen. It has taken me nearly thirty years, said Mr. Wimbush, twenty-five years of writing and nearly four of printing, and now it's finished. The whole chronicle from Sir Ferdinando Lapith's birth to the death of my father William Wimbush, more than three centuries and a half, a history of Crome, written at Crome, and printed at Crome by my own press. Shall we be allowed to read it now it's finished? asked Dennis. Mr. Wimbush nodded. Certainly, he said, and I hope you will not find it uninteresting. 
added modestly. Our muniment room is particularly rich in ancient records, and I have some genuinely new light to throw on the introduction of the three-pronged fork. And the people, asked Gombold, Sir Ferdinando, and the rest of them, were they amusing? Were there any crimes or tragedies in the family? Let me see. Henry Wimbush rubbed his chin thoughtfully. I can only think of two suicides, one violent death, four or perhaps five broken hearts, and half a dozen little blots on the scutcheon in the way of misalliances, seductions, natural children, and the like. No, on the whole it's a placid and uneventful record. The Wimbushes and the Lapiths were always an unadventurous, respectable crew, said Priscilla, with a note of scorn in her voice. If I were to write my family history now, why, it would be one long, continuous blot from beginning to end. She laughed jovially, and helped herself to another glass of wine. If I were to write mine, Mr. Scogan remarked, it wouldn't exist. After the second generations, we Scogans are lost in the mists of antiquity. After dinner, said Henry Wimbush, a little piqued by his wife's disparaging comment on the masters of Crome, I'll read you an episode from my history that will make you admit that even the Lapiths, in their own respectable way, had their tragedies and strange adventures. I'm glad to hear it, said Priscilla. Glad to hear what? asked Jenny, emerging suddenly from her private interior world like a cuckoo from a clock. She received an explanation, smiled, nodded, cuckooed at last, I see, and popped back, clapping shut the door behind her. Dinner was eaten. The party had adjourned to the drawing-room. Now, said Henry Wimbush, pulling up a chair to the lamp, he put on his round pince-nez, rimmed with tortoiseshell, and began cautiously to turn over the pages of his loose and still fragmentary book. He found his place at last. Shall I begin? he asked, looking up. Do, said Priscilla, yawning. In the midst of an attentive silence, Mr. Wimbush gave a little preliminary cough and started to read. The infant who was destined to become the fourth baronet of the name of Lapith was born in the year 1740. He was a very small baby, weighing not more than three pounds at birth. But from the first he was sturdy and healthy. In honour of his maternal grandfather, Sir Hercules Ockham of Bishop's Ockham, he was christened Hercules. His mother, like many other mothers, kept a notebook in which his progress from month to month was recorded. He walked at ten months, and before his second year was out he had learned to speak a number of words. At three years he weighed but twenty-four pounds, and at six, though he could read and write perfectly, and showed a remarkable aptitude for music, he was no larger and heavier than a well-grown child of two. Meanwhile his mother had borne two other children, a boy and a girl, one of whom died of croup during infancy, while the other was carried off by smallpox before it reached the age of five. Hercules remained the only surviving child. On his twelfth birthday, Hercules was still only three feet and two inches in height. His head, which was very handsome and nobly shaped, was too big for his body, but otherwise he was exquisitely proportioned, and, for his size, of great strength and agility. His parents, in the hope of making him grow, consulted all the most eminent physicians of the time. Their various prescriptions were followed to the letter, but in vain. One ordered a very plentiful meat diet, another exercise, a third constructed a little rack, modelled on those employed by the Holy Inquisition, to which Hercules was stretched with excruciating torments for half an hour every morning and evening. In the course of the next three years Hercules gained perhaps two inches. After that his growth stopped completely, and he remained for the rest of his life a pygmy of three feet and four inches. His father, who had built the most extravagant hopes upon his son, planning for him in his imagination a military career equal to that of Marlborough, found himself a disappointed man. "'I have brought an abortion into the world,' he would say. And he took so violent a dislike to his son that the boy dared scarcely come into his presence. His temper, which had been serene, was turned by disappointment to moroseness and savagery. He avoided all company, being, as he said, ashamed to show himself the father of a lucis naturae amongst normal, healthy human beings, and took to solitary drinking, which carried him very rapidly to his grave. For, the year before Hercules came of age, his father was taken off by an apoplexy. 
His mother, whose love for him had increased with the growth of his father's unkindness, did not long survive, but little more than a year after her husband's death succumbed, after eating two dozen of oysters, to an attack of typhoid fever. Hercules thus found himself at the age of twenty-one alone in the world, and master of a considerable fortune, including the estate and mansion of Crome. The beauty and intelligence of his childhood had survived into his manly age, and, but for his dwarfish stature, he would have taken his place among the handsomest and most accomplished young men of his time. He was well read in the Greek and Latin authors, as well as in all the moderns of any merit who had written in English, French, or Italian. He had a good ear for music, and was no indifferent performer on the violin, which he used to play like a bass viol, seated on a chair with the instrument between his legs. To the music of the harpsichord and clavichord he was extremely partial, but the smallness of his hands made it impossible for him ever to perform upon these instruments. He had a small ivory flute made for him, on which, whenever he was melancholy, he used to play a simple country air or jig, affirming that this rustic music had more power to clear and raise the spirits than the most artificial productions of the masters. From an early age he practised the composition of poetry, but, though conscious of his great powers in this art, he would never publish any specimen of his writing. My stature, he would say, is reflected in my verses. If the public were to read them, it would not be because I am a poet, but because I am a dwarf. Several manuscript books of Sir Hercules' poems survive. A single specimen will suffice to illustrate his qualities as a poet. In ancient days, while yet the world was young, ere Abram fed his flocks or Homer sung, when blacksmith Jubal tamed creative fire, and Jabal dwelt in tents, and Jubal struck the lyre, flesh grown corrupt brought forth a monstrous birth, and obscene giants trod the shrinking earth, till God, impatient of their sinful brood, gave rain to wrath and drowned them in the flood. Teeming again, repeopled Tellus bore the lubber hero and the man of war, huge towers of brawn topped with an empty skull, witlessly bold, heroically dull. Long ages passed, and man grown more refined, slighter in muscle but of vaster mind, smiled at his grandsire's broadsword, bow and bill, and learned to wield the pencil and the quill. The glowing canvas and the written page immortalized his name from age to age, his name emblazoned on fame's temple wall, for art grew great as humankind grew small. Thus man's long progress step by step we trace, the giant dies, the hero takes his place the giant vile, the dull heroic block, at one we shudder and at one we mock. Man last appears. In him the soul's pure flame burns brightlier in a not inordinate frame. Of old when heroes fought and giants swarmed, men were huge mounds of matter scarce informed. Wearied by leavening so vast a mass, the spirit slept, and all the mind was crass. The smaller carcass of these latter days is soon informed. The soul unwearied plays, and like a pharaoh's darts abroad her mental rays. But can we think that providence will stay man's footsteps here upon the upward way? Mankind in understanding and in grace advanced so far beyond the giant's race? Hence, impious thought, still, led by God's own hand, mankind proceeds towards the promised land. A time will come, prophetic, I descry remoter dawns along the gloomy sky when happy mortals of a golden age will backwards turn the dark historic page, and, in our vaunted race of men, behold a form as gross, a mind as dead and cold, as we in giants see, in warriors of old. A time will come when in the soul shall be from all superfluous matter wholly free, when the light body, agile as a fawn, shall sport with grace along the velvet lawns. Nature's most delicate and final birth Mankind, perfected, shall possess the earth. But ah, not yet, for still the giant's race, huge, though diminished, tramps the earth's fair face, gross and repulsive, yet perversely proud. Men of their imperfections boast aloud. Vain of their bulk, of all they still retain, of giant ugliness, absurdly vain. At all that small they point their stupid scorn, and, monsters, think themselves divinely born. Sad is the fate of those, are sad indeed, the rare precursors of the nobler breed, who come man's golden glory to foretell, 
but pointing heavenwards, live themselves in hell. As soon as he came into the estate, Sir Hercules set about remodelling his household, for, though by no means ashamed of his deformity, indeed, if we may judge from the poem quoted above, he regarded himself as being in many ways superior to the ordinary race of man, he found the presence of full-grown men and women embarrassing. Realising, too, that he must abandon all ambitions in the great world, he determined to retire absolutely from it, and to create, as it were, at Crome, a private world of his own, in which all should be proportionable to himself. Accordingly, he discharged all the old servants of the house, and replaced them, gradually, as he was able to find suitable successors, by others of dwarfish stature. In the course of a few years he had assembled about himself a numerous household, no member of which was above four feet high, and the smallest among them scarcely two feet and six inches. His father's dogs, such as setters, mastiffs, greyhounds, and a pack of beagles, he sold or gave away as too large and too boisterous for his house, replacing them by pugs and King Charles spaniels, and whatever other breeds of dog were the smallest. His father's stable was also sold. For his own use, whether riding or driving, he had six black Shetland ponies, with four very choice piebald animals of New Forest breed. Having thus settled his household entirely to his own satisfaction, it only remained for him to find some suitable companion with whom to share his paradise. Sir Hercules had a susceptible heart, and had more than once, between the ages of sixteen and twenty, felt what it was to love. But here his deformity had been a source of the most bitter humiliation, for, having once dared to declare himself to a young lady of his choice, he had been received with laughter. On his persisting she had picked him up and shaken him like an importunate child, telling him to run away and plague her no more. The story soon got about. Indeed, the young lady herself used to tell it as a particularly pleasant anecdote and the taunts and mockery it occasioned were a source of the most acute distress to Hercules. From the poems written at this period we gather that he meditated taking his own life. In course of time, however, he lived down this humiliation, but never again, though he often fell in love, and that very passionately, did he dare to make any advances to those in whom he was interested. After coming to the estate and finding that he was in a position to create his own world as he desired it, he saw that if he was to have a wife, which he very much desired, being of an affectionate and indeed amorous temper, he must choose her as he had chosen his servants, from among the race of dwarfs. But to find a suitable wife was, he found, a matter of some difficulty, for he would marry none who was not distinguished by beauty and gentle birth. The dwarfish daughter of Lord Bembra he refused on the ground that besides being a pygmy she was hunchbacked while another young lady, an orphan belonging to a very good family in Hampshire, was rejected by him because her face, like that of so many dwarfs, was wizened and repulsive. Finally, when he was almost despairing of success, he heard from a reliable source that Count Titimolo, a Venetian nobleman, possessed a daughter of exquisite beauty and great accomplishments, who was by three feet in height. Setting out at once for Venice, he went immediately on his arrival to pay his respects to the Count, whom he found living with his wife and five children in a very mean apartment in one of the poorer quarters of town. Indeed, the Count was so far reduced in his circumstances that he was even negotiating, so it was rumoured, with a travelling company of clowns and acrobats who had had the misfortune to lose their performing dwarf for the sale of his diminutive daughter Philomena. Sir Hercules arrived in time to save her from this untoward fate, for he was so much charmed by Philomena's grace and beauty, that at the end of three days' courtship he made her a formal offer of marriage, which was accepted by her no less joyfully than by her father, who perceived in an English son-in-law a rich and unfailing source of revenue. After an unostentatious marriage, at which the English ambassador acted as one of the witnesses, Sir Hercules and his bride returned by sea to England, where they settled down, as it proved, to a life of uneventful happiness. Crome and its household of dwarfs delighted Philomena, who felt herself now, for the first time, to be a free woman living among her equals in a friendly world. She had many tastes in common with her husband, especially that of music. 
she had a beautiful voice of a power surprising in one so small, and could touch A in alt without effort. Accompanied by her husband on his fine Cremona fiddle, which he played, as we have noted before, as one plays the bass viol, she would sing all the liveliest and tenderest airs from the operas and cantatas of her native country. Seated together at the harpsichord, they found that they could, with their four hands, play all the music written for two hands of ordinary size, a circumstance which gave Sir Hercules unfailing pleasure. When they were not making music or reading together, which they often did, both in English and Italian, they spent their time in healthful outdoor exercises, sometimes rowing in a little boat on the lake, but more often riding or driving, occupations in which, because they were entirely new to her, Philomena especially delighted. When she had become a perfectly proficient rider, Philomena and her husband used often to go hunting in the park, at that time very much more extensive than it is now. They hunted not foxes, nor hares, but rabbits, using a pack of about thirty black and fawn-coloured pugs, a kind of dog which, when not overfed, can course a rabbit as well as any of the smaller breeds. Four dwarf grooms, dressed in scarlet liveries and mounted on white Exmoor ponies, hunted the pack, while their master and mistress, in green habits, followed either on the black Shetlands or on the piebald New Forest ponies. A picture of the whole hunt, dogs, horses, grooms and masters, was painted by William Stubbs, whose work Sir Hercules admired so much that he invited him, though a man of ordinary stature, to come and stay at the mansion for the purpose of executing this picture. Stubbs likewise painted a portrait of Sir Hercules and his lady, driving in their green enamelled calash, drawn by four black Shetlands. Sir Hercules wears a plum-coloured velvet coat and white breeches. Philomena is dressed in flowered muslin and a very large hat with pink feathers. The two figures in their gay carriage stand out sharply against a dark background of trees. But to the left of the picture the trees fall away and disappear, so that the four black ponies are seen against a pale and strangely lurid sky that has the golden-brown colour of thunderclouds lighted up by the sun. In this way four years passed happily by. At the end of that time Philomena found herself great with child. Sir Hercules was overjoyed. If God is good, he wrote in his day-book, the name of Lapith will be preserved, and our rarer and more delicate race transmitted through the generations, until, in the fullness of time, the world shall recognise the superiority of those beings whom now it uses to make mock of. On his wife's being brought to bed of a son, he wrote a poem to the same effect. The child was christened Ferdinando, in memory of the builder of the house. With the passage of the months a certain sense of disquiet began to invade the minds of Sir Hercules and his lady, for the child was growing with an extraordinary rapidity. At a year he weighed as much as Hercules had weighed when he was three. Ferdinando grows crescendo, wrote Philomena in her diary. It seems not natural. At eighteen months the baby was almost as tall as their smallest jockey, who was a man of thirty-six. Could it be that Ferdinando was destined to become a man of the normal, gigantic dimensions? It was a thought to which neither of his parents dared yet give open utterance, but in the secrecy of their respective diaries they brooded over it in terror and dismay. On his third birthday Ferdinando was taller than his mother, and not more than a couple of inches short of his father's height. Today, for the first time, wrote Sir Hercules, we discussed the situation. The hideous truth can be concealed no longer. Ferdinando is not one of us. On this, his third birthday, a day when we should have been rejoicing at the health, the strength and beauty of our child, we wept together over the ruin of our happiness. God give us strength to bear this cross. At the age of eight, Ferdinando was so large and so exuberantly healthy that his parents decided, though reluctantly, to send him to school. He was packed off to Eton at the beginning of the next half. A profound peace settled upon the house. Ferdinando returned for the summer holidays, larger and stronger than ever. One day he knocked down the butler and broke his arm. He is rough, inconsiderate, unamenable to persuasion, wrote his father. The only thing that will teach him manners is corporal chastisement. Ferdinando, who, 
at this age was already seventeen inches taller than his father, received no corporal chastisement. One summer holidays, about three years later, Ferdinando returned to Crome, accompanied by a very large mastiff dog. He had bought it from an old man at Windsor who had found the beast too expensive to feed. It was a savage, unreliable animal, hardly had it entered the house when it attacked one of Sir Hercules' favourite pugs, seizing the creature in its jaws and shaking it till it was nearly dead. Extremely put out by this occurrence, Sir Hercules ordered that the beast should be chained up in the stable yard. Ferdinando sullenly answered that the dog was his, and he would keep it where he pleased. His father, growing angry, bade him take the animal out of the house at once, on pain of his utmost displeasure. Ferdinando refused to move. His mother at this moment coming into the room, the dog flew at her, knocked her down, and in a twinkling had very severely mauled her arm and shoulder. In another instant it must infallibly have had her by the throat, had not Sir Hercules drawn his sword and stabbed the animal to the heart. Turning on his son, he ordered him to leave the room immediately, as being unfit to remain in the same place with the mother whom he had nearly murdered. So awe-inspiring was the spectacle of Sir Hercules standing with one foot on the carcass of the giant dog, his sword drawn and still bloody, so commanding were his voice, his gestures, and the expression of his face, that Ferdinando slunk out of the room in terror, and behaved himself for all the rest of the vacation in an entirely exemplary fashion. His mother soon recovered from the bites of the mastiff, but the effect on her mind of this adventure was ineradicable. From that time forth she lived always among imaginary terrors. The two years which Ferdinando spent on the continent making the grand tour were a period of happy repose for his parents. But even now the thought of the future haunted them, nor were they able to solace themselves with all the diversions of their younger days. The Lady Philomena had lost her voice, and Sir Hercules was grown too rheumatical to play the violin. He, it is true, still rode after his pugs, but his wife felt herself too old, and, since the episode of the Mastiff, too nervous for such sports. At most, to please her husband, she would follow the hunt at a distance in a little gig, drawn by the safest and oldest of the Shetlands. The day fixed for Ferdinando's return came round. Philomena, sick with vague dreads and presentiments, retired to her chamber and her bed. Sir Hercules received his son alone. A giant in a brown travelling suit entered the room. "'Welcome home, my son,' said Sir Hercules, in a voice that trembled a little. "'I hope I see you well, sir.' Ferdinando bent down to shake hands, then straightened himself up again. The top of his father's head reached to the level of his hip. Ferdinando had not come alone. Two friends of his own age accompanied him, and each of the young men had brought a servant. Not for thirty years had Crome been desecrated by the presence of so many members of the common race of men. Sir Hercules was appalled and indignant, but the laws of hospitality had to be obeyed. He received the young gentleman with grave politeness, and sent the servants to the kitchen, with orders that they should be well cared for. The old family dining-table was dragged out into the light and dusted. Sir Hercules and his lady were accustomed to dine at a small table twenty inches high. Simon, the aged butler, who could only just look over the edge of the big table, was helped at supper by the three servants brought by Ferdinando and his guests. Sir Hercules presided, and, with his usual grace, supported a conversation on the pleasures of foreign travel, the beauties of art and nature to be met with abroad, the opera at Venice, the singing of the orphans in the churches of the same city, and on other topics of similar nature. The young men were not particularly attentive to his discourses. They were occupied in watching the efforts of the butler to change the plates and replenish the glasses. They covered their laughter by violent and repeated fits of coughing or choking. Sir Hercules affected not to notice, but changed the subject of the conversation to sport. Upon this one of the young men asked whether it was true, as he had heard, that he used to hunt the rabbit with a pack of pug dogs. Sir Hercules replied that it was, and proceeded to describe the chase in some detail. The young man roared with laughter. When supper was over, Sir Hercules climbed down from his chair, and, 
giving as his excuse that he must see how his lady did, bade them good night. The sound of laughter followed him up the stairs. Philomena was not asleep. She had been lying on her bed, listening to the sound of enormous laughter and the tread of strangely heavy feet on the stairs and along the corridors. Sir Hercules drew a chair to her bedside and sat there for a long time in silence, holding his wife's hand and sometimes gently squeezing it. At about ten o'clock they were startled by a violent noise. There was a breaking of glass, a stamping of feet, with an outburst of shouts and laughter. The uproar continuing for several minutes, Sir Hercules rose to his feet and, in spite of his wife's entreaties, prepared to go and see what was happening. There was no light on the staircase, and Sir Hercules groped his way down cautiously, lowering himself from stair to stair, and standing for a moment on each tread before adventuring on a new step. The noise was louder here, the shouting articulated itself into recognisable words and phrases. A line of light was visible under the dining-room door. Sir Hercules tiptoed across the hall towards it. Just as he approached the door there was another terrific crash of breaking glass and jangled metal. What could they be doing? Standing on tiptoe he managed to look through the keyhole. In the middle of the ravaged table old Simon, the butler so primed with drink that he could scarcely keep his balance, was dancing a jig. His feet crunched and tinkled among the broken glass, and his shoes were wet with spilt wine. The three young men sat round, thumping the table with their hands or with the empty wine bottles, shouting and laughing encouragement. The three servants, leaning against the wall, laughed too. Ferdinando suddenly threw a handful of walnuts at the dancer's head, which so dazed and surprised the little man that he staggered and fell down on his back, upsetting a decanter and several glasses. They raised him up, gave him some brandy to drink, thumped him on the back. The old man smiled and hiccuped. "'Tomorrow,' said Ferdinando, "'we'll have a concerted ballet of the whole household. With Father Hercules wearing his club and lion skin,' added one of his companions, and all three roared with laughter. Sir Hercules would look and listen no further. He crossed the hall once more, and began to climb the stairs, lifting his knees painfully high at each degree. This was the end. There was no place for him now in the world, no place for him and Ferdinando together. His wife was still awake. To her questioning glance he answered, They are making a mock of old Simon. Tomorrow it will be our turn. They were silent for a time. At last Philomena said, I do not want to see tomorrow. It is better not, said Sir Hercules. Going into his closet, he wrote in his day-book a full and particular account of all the events of the evening. While he was still engaged in this task, he rang for a servant, and ordered hot water and a bath to be made ready for him at eleven o'clock. When he had finished writing, he went into his wife's room, and, preparing a dose of opium twenty times as strong as that which she was accustomed to take when she could not sleep, he brought it into her, saying, Here is your sleeping draught. Philomena took the glass and lay for a little time, but did not drink immediately. The tears came into her eyes. Do you remember the songs we used to sing, sitting out there sulla terrazza in the summer-time? She began singing softly in her ghost of a cracked voice, a few bars from Stradella's Amor, Amor, Don Dormia Piu, and you playing the violin. It seems such a short time ago, and yet so long, long, long. Adio, amore, arrivederci. She drank off the draught, and, lying back on the pillow, closed her eyes. Sir Hercules kissed her hand and tiptoed away, as though he were afraid of waking her. He returned to his closet, and, having recorded his wife's last words to him, he poured into his bath the water that had been brought up in accordance with his orders. The water being too hot for him to get into the bath at once, he took down from the shelf his copy of Suetonius. He wished to read how Seneca had died. He opened the book at random. But dwarfs, he read, he held in abhorrence as being lucus naturae, and of ill omen. He winced as though he had been struck. This same Augustus, he remembered, had exhibited in the amphitheatre a young man called Lucius, of good family, who was not quite two feet in height, and weighed seventeen pounds but had a stentorian voice, 
He turned over the pages. Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. It was a tale of growing horror. Seneca, his preceptor, he forced to kill himself. And there was Pretorius, who had called his friends about him at the last, bidding them to talk to him, not of the consolations of philosophy, but of love and gallantry, while the life was ebbing away through his open veins. Dipping his pen once more in the ink, he wrote on the last page of his diary, he died a Roman death. Then, putting the toes of one foot into the water, and finding that it was not too hot, he threw off his dressing-gown and, taking a razor in his hand, sat down in the bath. With one deep cut, he severed the artery in his left wrist, then lay back and composed his mind to meditation. The blood oozed out, floating through the water in dissolving wreaths and spirals. In a little while the whole bath was tinged with pink. The colour deepened. Sir Hercules felt himself mastered by an invincible drowsiness. He was sinking from vague dream to dream. Soon he was sound asleep. There was not much blood in his small body. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 14 For their after-luncheon coffee the party generally adjourned to the library. Its windows looked east, and at this hour of the day it was the coolest place in the whole house. It was a large room, fitted during the eighteenth century, with white painted shelves of an elegant design. In the middle of one wall a door, ingeniously upholstered with rows of dummy books, gave access to a deep cupboard, where, among a pile of letter-files and old newspapers, the mummy-case of an Egyptian lady, brought back by the second Sir Ferdinando on his return from the Grand Tour, mouldered in the darkness. From ten yards away, and at first glance, one might almost have mistaken this secret door for a section of shelving filled with genuine books. Coffee cup in hand, Mr. Scogan was standing in front of the dummy bookshelf. Between the sips he discoursed. The bottom shelf, he was saying, is taken up by an encyclopaedia in fourteen volumes. Useful but a little dull, as is also Caprimulge's Dictionary of the Finnish Language. The biographical dictionary looks more promising. Biography of men who were born great. Biography of men who achieved greatness, biography of men who had greatness thrust upon them, and biography of men who were never great at all. Then there are ten volumes of Tom's Works and Wanderings, while The Wild Goose Chase, a novel, by an anonymous author, fills no less than six. But what's this? What's this? Mr. Scogan stood on tiptoe and peered up. Seven volumes of The Tales of Knockenspotch. The Tales of Knockenspotch, he repeated. "'Ah, my dear Henry,' he said, turning round, "'these are your best books. I would willingly give all the rest of your library for them.' The happy possessor of a multitude of first editions, Mr. Wimbush, could afford to smile indulgently. "'Is it possible,' Mr. Scogan went on, "'that they possess nothing more than a back and a title?' He opened the cupboard door and peeped inside, as though he hoped to find the rest of the books behind it. "'Phew!' he said, and shut the door again. It smells of dust and mildew. How symbolical! One comes to the great masterpieces of the past, expecting some miraculous illumination, and one finds, on opening them, only darkness and dust and a faint smell of decay. After all, what is reading but a vice, like drink or venery or any other form of excessive self-indulgence? One reads to tickle and amuse one's mind. One reads, above all, to prevent oneself thinking. Still, the tales of knock and spotch. He paused and thoughtfully drummed with his fingers on the backs of the non-existent, unattainable books. But I disagree with you about reading, said Mary, about serious reading, I mean. Quite right, Mary, quite right, Mr. Scogan answered. I had forgotten there were any serious people in the room. I like the idea of biographies, said Dennis. There's room for us all within the scheme. It's comprehensive. Yes, the biographies are good, the biographies are excellent, Mr. Scogan agreed. I imagine them written in a very elegant Regency style. Brighton Pavilion in words, perhaps by the greatest de Lamprière himself. You know his classical dictionary? Ah, Mr. Scogan raised his hand and let it limply fall again in a gesture which implied that words failed him. 
Read his biography of Helen. Read how Jupiter, disguised as a swan, was enabled to avail himself of the situation. Vis-à-vis -vis to Leda. And to think that he may have, must have written these biographies of the great. What a work, Henry. And owing to the idiotic arrangement of your library, it can't be read. I prefer The Wild Goose Chase, said Anne, a novel in six volumes. It must be restful. Restful, Mr. Scogan repeated. You've hit on the right word. A wild goose chase is sound, but a bit old-fashioned. Pictures of clerical life in the fifties, you know, specimens of the landed gentry, peasants for pathos and comedy, and in the background always the picturesque beauties of nature soberly described. All very good and solid, but, like certain puddings, just a little dull. Personally, I like much better the notion of Tom's works and wanderings. The eccentric Mr. Tom of Tom's Hill. Old Tom Tom, as his intimates used to call him. He spent ten years in Tibet organising the clarified butter industry on modern European lines, and was able to retire at thirty-six with a handsome fortune. The rest of his life he devoted to travel and ratiocination. Here is the result. Mr. Scogan tapped the dummy books, and now we come to the tales of Knock and Spotch. What a masterpiece, and what a great man! Knock and Spotch knew how to write fiction. Ah, Dennis, if you could only read Knock and Spotch, you wouldn't be writing a novel about the wearisome development of a young man's character. You wouldn't be describing in endless fastidious detail cultured life in Chelsea and Bloomsbury and Hampstead. You would be trying to write a readable book. But then, alas, owing to the peculiar arrangement of our host's library, you will never read Knock and Spotch. Nobody could regret the fact more than I do, said Dennis. It was Knock and Spotch, Mr. Scogan continued, the great Knock and Spotch, who delivered us from the dreary tyranny of the realistic novel. My life, Knock and Spotch said, is not so long that I can afford to spend precious hours writing or reading descriptions of middle-class interiors. He said again, I am tired of seeing the human mind bogged in a social plenum. I prefer to paint it in a vacuum, freely and sportively bombinating. I say, said Gombold, Knock and Spotch was a little obscure sometimes, wasn't he? He was, Mr. Scogan replied, and with intention. It made him seem even profounder than he actually was. But it was only in his aphorisms that he was so dark and oracular. In his tales he was always luminous. Oh, those tales, those tales! How shall I describe them? Fabulous characters shoot across his pages like gaily dressed performers on the trapeze. There are extraordinary adventures and still more extraordinary speculations. Intelligences and emotions, relieved of all the imbecile preoccupations of civilized life, move in intricate and subtle dances, crossing and recrossing, advancing, retreating, impinging. An immense erudition and an immense fancy go hand in hand. All the ideas of the present and of the past, on every possible subject, bob up among the tales, smile gravely or grimace at a caricature of themselves, then disappear to make place for something new. The verbal surface of his writing is rich and fantastically diversified. The wit is incessant. The... But couldn't you give us a specimen? Dennis broke in. A concrete example? Alas, Mr. Scogan replied, Knock and Spotch's great book is like the sword Excalibur. It remains stuck fast in this door, awaiting the coming of a writer with genius enough to draw it forth. I am not even a writer. I am not so much as qualified to attempt the task. The extraction of knock and spot from this wooden prison I leave, my dear Dennis, to you. Thank you, said Dennis. End of chapter. Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 15 In the time of the amiable Brantome, Mr. Scogan was saying, every debutante at the French court was invited to dine at the King's Table, where she was served with wine in a handsome silver cup of Italian workmanship. It was no ordinary cup, this goblet of the debutantes, for, inside, it had been most curiously and ingeniously engraved, with a series of very lively amorous scenes. With each draught that the young lady swallowed, these engravings became increasingly visible, and the court looked on with interest every time she put her nose in the cup, to see whether she blushed at what the ebbing wine revealed. If the debutante blushed, they laughed at her for her innocence. If she did not, she was laughed at for being too knowing. 
"'Do you propose,' asked Anne, "'that the custom should be revived at Buckingham Palace?' "'I do not,' said Mr. Scogan. "'I merely quoted the anecdote as an illustration of the custom, "'so genially frank, of the sixteenth century. "'I might have quoted other anecdotes "'to show that the customs of the seventeenth and eighteenth, "'of the fifteenth and fourteenth centuries, "'and indeed every other century, "'from the time of Hammurabi onwards, "'were equally genial and equally frank. "'The only century in which customs were not characterised "'by the same cheerful openness was the nineteenth, "'of blessed memory.' It was the astonishing exception, and yet, with what one must suppose was a deliberate disregard of history, it looked upon its horribly pregnant silences as normal and natural and right. The frankness of the previous fifteen or twenty thousand years was considered abnormal and perverse. It was a curious phenomenon. "'I entirely agree,' Mary panted with excitement in her effort to bring out what she had to say. "'Havelock Ellis says—' Mr. Scogan, like a policeman arresting the flow of traffic, held up his hand. He does, I know, and that brings me to my next point, the nature of the reaction. Havelock Ellis, the reaction, when it came, and we may say roughly that it set in a little before the beginning of this century, the reaction was to openness, but not to the same openness as had reigned in the earlier ages. It was to a scientific openness, not to the jovial frankness of the past, that we returned. The whole question of amour became a terribly serious one. Earnest young men wrote in the public prints that from this time forth it would be impossible ever again to make a joke of any sexual matter. Professors wrote thick books in which sex was sterilised and dissected. It has become customary for serious young women, like Mary, to discuss with philosophic calm matters of which the merest hint would have sufficed to throw the youth of the sixties into a delirium of amorous excitement. It is all very estimable, no doubt. But still, Mr. Scogan sighed, I, for one, should like to see, mingled with this scientific ardour, a little more of the jovial spirit of Rabelais and Chaucer. I entirely disagree with you, said Mary. Sex isn't a laughing matter, it's serious. Perhaps, answered Mr. Scogan, perhaps I'm an obscene old man, for I must confess that I cannot always regard it as wholly serious. But I tell you, began Mary furiously, her face had flushed with excitement, her cheeks were the cheeks of a great ripe peach. Indeed, Mr. Scogan continued, it seems to me one of few permanently and everlastingly amusing subjects that exist. A more is the one human activity of any importance in which laughter and pleasure preponderate, if ever so slightly, over misery and pain. I entirely disagree, said Mary. There was a silence. Anne looked at her watch. Nearly a quarter to eight, she said. I wonder when Ivor will turn up. She got up from her deck-chair, and, leaning her elbows on the balustrade of the terrace, looked out over the valley and towards the farther hills. Under the level evening sun the architecture of the land revealed itself. The deep shadows, the bright contrasting lights, gave the hills a new solidity. Irregularities of the surface, unsuspected before, were picked out with light and shade. The grass, the corn, the foliage of trees were stippled with intricate shadows. The surface of things had taken on a marvellous enrichment. Look, said Anne suddenly, and pointed. On the opposite side of the valley, at the crest of the ridge, a cloud of dust flushed by the sunlight to rosy gold was moving rapidly along the skyline. It's either, one can tell by the speed. The dust cloud descended into the valley and was lost. A horn with the voice of a sea lion made itself heard, approaching. A minute later, Ivor came leaping round the corner of the house. His hair waved in the wind of his own speed. He laughed as he saw them. Anne, darling, he cried, and embraced her, embraced Mary, very nearly embraced Mr. Scogan. Well, here I am. I've come with incredulous speed. Ivor's vocabulary was rich, but a little erratic. I'm not late for dinner, am I? He hoisted himself up onto the balustrade and sat there, kicking his heels. With one arm he embraced a large stone flower-pot, leaning his head sideways against its hard and lichenous flanks in an attitude of trustful affection. He had brown, wavy hair, and his eyes were of a very brilliant, pale, improbable blue. His head was narrow, his face thin and rather long, his nose aquiline. In old age, though it was difficult to imagine either old, he might grow to have an iron ducal grimness. But now, at twenty-six, it was not the structure of his face that impressed one, 
it was its expression. That was charming and vivacious, and his smile was an irradiation. He was forever moving, restlessly and rapidly, but with an engaging gracefulness. His frail and slender body seemed to be fed by a spring of inexhaustible energy. "'No, you're not late.' "'You're in time to answer a question,' said Mr. Scogan. "'We were arguing whether Amour were a serious matter or no. "'What do you think? Is it serious?' "'Serious?' echoed Ivor. "'Most certainly.' "'I told you so,' cried Mary triumphantly. "'But in what sense serious?' Mr. Scogan asked. "'I mean as an occupation. "'One can go on with it without ever getting bored.' "'I see,' said Mr. Scogan. "'Perfectly.' "'One can occupy oneself with it,' Ivor continued, "'always and everywhere.' Women are always wonderfully the same. Shapes vary a little, that's all. In Spain, with his free hand, he described a series of ample curves. One can't pass them on the stairs. In England, he put the tip of his forefinger against the tip of his thumb, and, lowering his hand, drew out this circle into an imaginary cylinder. In England, they're tubular, but their sentiments are always the same. At least, I've always found it so. I'm delighted to hear it, said Mr. Scogan. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 16 The ladies had left the room, and the port was circulating. Mr. Scogan filled his glass, passed on the decanter, and, leaning back in his chair, looked about him for a moment in silence. The conversation rippled idly around him, but he disregarded it. He was smiling at some private joke. Gombold noticed his smile. "'What's amusing you?' he asked. "'I was just looking at you all, sitting round this table,' said Mr. Scogan. "'Are we as comic as all that?' "'Not at all,' Mr. Scogan answered politely. "'I was merely amused by my own speculations.' "'And what were they?' "'The idlest, the most academic of speculations. "'I was looking at you one by one, "'and trying to imagine which of the first six Caesars you would each resemble, "'if you were given the opportunity of behaving like a Caesar.' The Caesars are one of my touchstones, Mr. Scogan explained. They are characters functioning, so to speak, in the void. They are human beings developed to their logical conclusions. Hence their unequalled value as a touchstone, a standard. When I meet someone for the first time, I ask myself this question. Given the Caesarian environment, which of the Caesars would this person resemble? Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero? I take each trait of character, each mental and emotional bias, each little oddity, and magnify them a thousand times. The resulting image gives me his Caesarian formula. And which of the Caesars do you resemble? asked Gombold. I'm potentially all of them, Mr. Scogan replied, all, with the possible exception of Claudius, who was much too stupid to be a development of anything in my character. The seeds of Julius' courage and compelling energy, of Augustus' prudence, of the libidinousness and cruelty of Tiberius, of Caligula's folly, of Nero's artistic genius and enormous vanity, are all within me. Given the opportunities, I might have been something fabulous. But circumstances were against me. I was born and brought up in a country rectory. I passed my youth doing a great deal of utterly senseless hard work for a very little money, the result is that now, in middle age, I am the poor thing that I am. But perhaps it is as well. Perhaps, too, it's as well that Dennis hasn't been permitted to flower into a little Nero, and that Ivor remains only potentially a Caligula. Yes, it's better so, no doubt. But it would have been more amusing, as a spectacle, if they had had the chance to develop untrammeled the full horror of their potentialities. It would have been pleasant and interesting to watch their tics and foibles and little vices swelling and burgeoning and blossoming into enormous and fantastic flowers of cruelty and pride and lewdness and avarice. The Caesarian environment makes the Caesar, as the special food and the queenly cell make the queen bee. We differ from the bees in so far that, given the proper food, they can be sure of making a queen every time. With us there is no such certainty. Out of every ten men placed in the Caesarian environment, one will be temperamentally good or intelligent or great. The rest will blossom into Caesars. He will not. Seventy and eighty years ago simple-minded people, reading of the exploits of the Bourbons in South Italy, cried out in amazement, to think that such things could be happening in the nineteenth century. 
and a few years since we too were astonished to find that in our still more astonishing twentieth century unhappy blackamoors on the congo and the amazon were being treated as english serfs were treated in the time of stephen to-day we are no longer surprised at these things the black and tans harry ireland the poles maltreat the silesians the bold fascisti slaughter their poorer countrymen we take it all for granted since the war we wonder at nothing we have created a caesarian environment and a host of little caesars has sprung up what could be more natural mr scogan drank off what was left of his port and refilled the glass at this very moment he went on the most frightful horrors are taking place in every corner of the world people are being crushed slashed disemboweled mangled their dead bodies rot and their eyes decay with the rest screams of pain and fear go pulsing through the air at the rate of eleven hundred feet per second after travelling for three seconds they are perfectly inaudible these are the distressing facts but do we enjoy life any less because of them most certainly we do not we feel sympathy no doubt we represent to ourselves imaginatively the suffering of nations and individuals and we deplore them but after all what are sympathy and imagination precious little unless the person for whom we feel sympathy happens to be closely involved in our affections and even then they don't go very far and a good thing too for if one had an imagination vivid enough and a sympathy sufficiently sensitive really to comprehend and to feel the sufferings of other people one would never have a moment's peace of mind a really sympathetic race would not so much as know the meaning of happiness but luckily as i've already said we aren't a sympathetic race at the beginning of the war i used to think i really suffered through imagination and sympathy with those who physically suffered but after a month or two i had to admit that honestly i didn't and yet i think i have a more vivid imagination than most one is always alone in suffering the fact is depressing when one happens to be the sufferer but it makes pleasure possible for the rest of the world there was a pause henry wimbush pushed back his chair i think perhaps we ought to go and join the ladies he said so do i said ivor jumping up with alacrity he turned to mr scogan fortunately he said we can share our pleasures we are not always condemned to be happy alone end of chapter chrome yellow by aldous huxley read for librivox dot org by martin clifton chapter seventeen ivor brought his hands down with a bang on to the final chord of his rhapsody there was just a hint in that triumphant harmony that the seventh had been struck along with the octave by the thumb of the left hand, but the general effect of splendid noise emerged clearly enough. Small details matter little so long as the general effect is good, and, besides, that hint of the seventh was decidedly modern. He turned round in his seat and tossed the hair back out of his eyes. There, he said, that's the best I can do for you, I'm afraid murmurs of applause and gratitude were heard and mary her large china eyes fixed on the performer cried out aloud wonderful and gasped for new breath as though she were suffocating nature and fortune had vied with one another in heaping on ivor lombard all their choicest gifts he had wealth and he was perfectly independent he was good-looking possessed an irresistible charm of manner and was the hero of more amorous successes than he could well remember his accomplishments were extraordinary for their number and variety. He had a beautiful, untrained tenor voice. He could improvise with a startling brilliance, rapidly and loudly, on the piano. He was a good amateur medium and telepathist, and had a considerable first-hand knowledge of the world. He could write rhymed verses with an extraordinary rapidity. For painting symbolical pictures he had a dashing style, and if the drawing was sometimes a little weak, the colour was always pyrotechnical. He excelled in amateur theatricals, and, when occasion offered, he could cook with genius. He resembled Shakespeare in knowing little Latin and less Greek. For a mind like his, education seems supererogatory. Training would only have destroyed his natural aptitudes. "'Let's go out into the garden,' Iva suggested. "'It's a wonderful night.' "'Thank you,' said Mr. Scogan. "'But I, for one, prefer these still more wonderful armchairs.' His pipe had begun to bubble oozily every time he pulled at it. He was perfectly happy. 
Henry Wimbush was also happy. He looked for a moment over his pince-nez in Ivor's direction, and then, without saying anything, returned to the grimy little sixteenth-century account books, which were now his favourite reading. He knew more about Sir Ferdinando's household expenses than about his own. The outdoor party enrolled under Ivor's banner consisted of Anne, Mary, Dennis, and, rather unexpectedly, Jenny. Outside it was warm and dark. There was no moon. They walked up and down the terrace, and Ivor sang a Neapolitan song, Stretti, Stretti, close, close, with something about the little Spanish girl to follow. The atmosphere began to palpitate. Ivor put his arm round Anne's waist, dropped his head sideways onto her shoulder, and in that position walked on, singing as he walked. It seemed the easiest, the most natural thing in the world. Dennis wondered why he had never done it. He hated Ivor. "'Let's go down to the pool,' said Ivor. He disengaged his embrace, and turned round to shepherd his little flock. They made their way along the side of the house to the entrance of the yew-tree walk that led down to the lower garden. Between the blank precipitous wall of the house and the tall yew-trees, the path was a chasm of impenetrable gloom. Somewhere there were steps down to the right, a gap in the yew-hedge. Dennis, who headed the party, groped his way cautiously. In this darkness one had an irrational fear of yawning precipices, of horrible spiked obstructions. Suddenly, from behind him, he heard a shrill, startled, Oh! and then a sharp, dry concussion that might have been the sound of a slap. After that, Jenny's voice was heard pronouncing, I'm going back to the house. Her tone was decided, and even as she pronounced the words, she was melting away into the darkness. The incident, whatever it had been, was closed. Dennis resumed his forward groping. From somewhere behind, Ivor began to sing again, softly. Phyllis, plus avare que tendre ne gagnant rien à refuser, un jour exigia à Sylvandre trois moutons pour un baiser. The melody dropped and climbed again with a kind of easy languor. The warm darkness seemed to pulse like blood about them. Le lendemain, nouvelle affaire. Pour le berger, le troc fut bon. Here are the steps, cried Dennis. He guided his companions over the danger, and in a moment they had the turf of the yew tree walk under their feet. It was lighter here, or at least it was just perceptibly less dark, for the yew walk was wider than the path that had led them under the lee of the house. Looking up, they could see between the high black hedges a strip of sky and a few stars. Car il obtint de la bergère, went on Ivor and then interrupted himself to shout, I'm going to run down, and he was off, full speed, down the invisible slope, singing unevenly as he went, Tron baiser pour un mouton. The others followed. Dennis shambled in the rear, vainly exhorting everyone to caution. The slope was steep, one might break one's neck. What was wrong with these people, he wondered. They had become like young kittens after a dose of catnip. He himself felt a certain kittenishness sporting within him, but it was, like all his emotions, rather a theoretical feeling. It did not overmasteringly seek to express itself in a practical demonstration of kittenishness. "'Be careful!' he shouted once more, and hardly were the words out of his mouth when, thump, there was the sound of a heavy fall in front of him, followed by the long of a breath indrawn with pain, and afterwards by a very sincere ooh. Dennis was almost pleased. He had told them so, the idiots, and they wouldn't listen. He trotted down the slope towards the unseen sufferer. Mary came down the hill like a runaway steam engine. It was tremendously exciting, this blind rush through the dark. She felt she would never stop. But the ground grew level beneath her feet, her speed insensibly slackened, and suddenly she was caught by an extended arm and brought to an abrupt halt. Well said Ivor, as he tightened his embrace. "'You're caught now, Anne.' She made an effort to release herself. "'It's not Anne, it's Mary.' Ivor burst into a peal of amused laughter. "'So it is!' he exclaimed. "'I seem to be making nothing but floaters this evening. I've already made one with Jenny.' He laughed again, and there was something so jolly about his laughter that Mary could not help laughing too. He did not remove his encircling arm, and somehow it was all so amusing and natural that Mary made no further attempt to escape from it. They walked along by the side of the pool, interlaced. Mary was too short for him to be able, with any comfort, to lay his head on her shoulder. He rubbed his cheek, 
caressed and caressing against the thick, sleek mass of her hair. In a little while he began to sing again. The knight trembled amorously to the sound of his voice. When he had finished, he kissed her. Anne or Mary, Mary or Anne, it didn't seem to make much difference which it was. There were differences in detail, of course, but the general effect was the same, and, after all, the general effect was the important thing. Dennis made his way down the hill. "'Any damage done?' he called out. "'Is that you, Dennis? I've hurt my ankle so, and my knee, and my hand. I'm all in pieces.' "'My poor Anne,' he said. But then, he couldn't help adding, it was silly to start running downhill in the dark. "'Ass!' she retorted, in a tone of tearful irritation. "'Of course it was.' He sat down beside her on the grass, and found himself breathing the faint, delicious atmosphere of perfume that she carried always with her. "'Light a match,' she commanded. "'I want to look at my wounds.' He felt in his pockets for the matchbox. The light spurted, and then grew steady. Magically, a little universe had been created, a world of colours and forms. Anne's face, the shimmering orange of her dress, her white, bare arms, a patch of green turf and round about a darkness that had become solid and utterly blind. Anne held out her hands. Both were green and earthy with her fall, and the left exhibited two or three red abrasions. Not so bad, she said, but Dennis was terribly distressed, and his emotion was intensified when, looking up at her face, he saw that the trace of tears, involuntary tears of pain, lingered on her eyelashes. He pulled out his handkerchief and began to wipe away the dirt from the wounded hand. The match went out. It was not worth while to light another. Anne allowed herself to be attended to meekly and gratefully. Thank you, she said, when he'd finished cleaning and bandaging her hand. And there was something in her tone that made him feel that she had lost her superiority over him, that she was younger than he, had become suddenly almost a child. He felt tremendously large and protective. The feeling was so strong that, instinctively, he put his arm about her. She drew closer, leaned against him, and so they sat in silence. Then, from below, soft but wonderfully clear through the still darkness, they heard the sound of Ivor's singing. He was going on with his half-finished song. Le lendemain Phyllis plus tendre, nous voulons de plaire au berger. Fut trop heureuse de lui rendre trois moutons pour un baiser. There was a rather prolonged pause. It was as though time were being allowed for the giving and receiving of a few of those thirty kisses. Then the voice sang on. Le lendemain, Félix put sage aurait dans mouton et chien pour un baiser que le village à Lisette donnait pour rien. The last note died away into an uninterrupted silence. "'Are you better?' Dennis whispered. "'Are you comfortable like this?' She nodded a yes to both questions. Trois moutons pour un baiser, the sheep, the woolly button, ba, 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 or the shepherd. Yes, decidedly, he felt himself to be the shepherd now. He was the master, the protector. A wave of courage swelled through him, warm as wine. He turned his head and began to kiss her face, at first rather randomly, then with more precision on the mouth. Anne averted her head. He kissed the ear, the smooth nape that his movements presented to him. No, she protested, no, Dennis. Why not? It spoils our friendship, and that was so jolly. Bosh, said Dennis. She tried to explain. Can't you see, she said, it isn't, it isn't our stunt at all. It was true. Somehow she had never thought of Dennis in the light of a man who might make love. She had never so much as conceived the possibilities of an amorous relationship with him. He was so absurdly young, so, so, she couldn't find the adjective, but she knew what she meant. Why isn't it our stunt, asked Dennis, and by the way, that's a horrible and inappropriate expression. Because it isn't. But if I say it is, it makes no difference. I say it isn't. I shall make you say it is. All right, Dennis, but you must do it another time. I must go in and get my ankle into hot water. It's beginning to swell. Reasons of health could not be gainsaid. Dennis got up reluctantly and helped his companion to her feet. She took a cautious step. Ooh! She halted and leaned heavily on his arm. I'll carry you, Dennis offered. He had never tried to carry a woman, but on the cinema it always looked an easy piece of heroism. You couldn't, said Anne. 
Of course I can. He felt larger and more protective than ever. Put your arms round my neck, he ordered. She did so, and, stooping, he picked her up under the knees and lifted her from the ground. Good heavens, what a weight! He took five staggering steps up the slope, then almost lost his equilibrium, and had to deposit his burden suddenly with something of a bump. Anne was shaking with laughter. I said you couldn't, my poor Dennis. I can, said Dennis, without conviction. I'll try again. It's perfectly sweet of you to offer, but I'd rather walk, thanks. She laid her hand on his shoulder, and, thus supported, began to limp slowly up the hill. My poor Dennis, she repeated, and laughed again. Humiliated, he was silent. It seemed incredible that only two minutes ago he should have been holding her in his embrace, kissing her. Incredible. She was helpless then, a child. Now she had regained all her superiority. She was once more the far-off being, desired and unassailable. Why had he been such a fool as to suggest that carrying stunt? He reached the house in a state of the profoundest depression. He helped Anne upstairs, left her in the hands of a maid, and came down again into the drawing-room. He was surprised to find them all sitting just where he had left them. He had expected that, somehow, everything would be quite different. It seemed such a prodigious time since he went away. All silent and all damned, he reflected, as he looked at them. Mr. Scogan's pipe still wheezed. That was the only sound. Henry Wimbush was still deep in his account books. He had just made the discovery that Sir Ferdinando was in the habit of eating oysters the whole summer through, regardless of the absence of the justifying R. Gombold, in horn-rimmed spectacles, was reading. Jenny was mysteriously scribbling in her red notebook. And, seated in her favourite armchair at the corner of the hearth, Priscilla was looking through a pile of drawings. One by one she held them out at arm's length, and, throwing back her mountainous orange head, looked long and attentively through half-closed eyelids. She wore a pale sea-green dress. On the slope of her mauve-powdered décolletage, diamonds twinkled. An immensely long cigarette holder projected at an angle from her face. Diamonds were embedded in her high-piled coiffure. They glittered every time she moved. It was a batch of Ivor's drawings, sketches of spirit life made in the course of tranced tours through the other world. On the back of each sheet, descriptive titles were written. Portrait of an Angel, 15th of March, 20. Astral Beings at Play, 3rd of December, 19. A Party of Souls on Their Way to a Higher Sphere, 21st of May, 21. Before examining the drawings on the obverse of each sheet, she turned it over to read the title. Try as she could, and she tried hard, Priscilla had never seen a vision, or succeeded in establishing any communication with the spirit world. She had to be content with the reported experiences of others. "'What have you done with the rest of your party?' she asked, looking up as Dennis entered the room. He explained. Anne had gone to bed. Ivor and Mary were still in the garden. He selected a book and a comfortable chair, and tried, as far as the disturbed state of his mind would permit him, to compose himself for an evening's reading. The lamplight was utterly serene. There was no movement, save the stir of Priscilla among her papers. All silent and all damned, Dennis repeated to himself, all silent and all damned. It was nearly an hour later when Ivor and Mary made their appearance. We waited to see the moon rise, said Ivor. It was gibbous, you know, Mary explained, very technical and scientific. It was so beautiful down in the garden, the trees, the scent of the flowers, the stars. Ivor waved his arms, and when the moon came up, it was really too much. It made me burst into tears. He sat down at the piano and opened the lid. There were a great many meteorites, said Mary, to anyone who would listen. The earth must just be coming into the summer shower of them, in July and August, but Ivor had already begun to strike the keys. He played the garden, the stars, the scent of the flowers, the rising moon. He even put in a nightingale that was not there. Mary looked on and listened with parted lips. The others pursued their occupations without appearing to be seriously disturbed. On this very July day, exactly three hundred and fifty years ago, Sir Ferdinando had eaten seven dozen oysters— 
The discovery of this fact gave Henry Wimbush a peculiar pleasure. He had a natural piety which made him delight in the celebration of memorial feasts. Three hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the seven dozen oysters. He wished he'd known before dinner he would have ordered champagne. On her way to bed, Mary paid a call. The light was out in Anne's room, but she was not yet asleep. "'Why didn't you come down to the garden with us?' Mary asked. I fell down and twisted my ankle. Dennis helped me home. Mary was full of sympathy. Inwardly, too, she was relieved to find Anne's non-appearance so simply accounted for. She had been vaguely suspicious down there in the garden, suspicious of what she hardly knew, but there had seemed to be something a little louche in the way she had suddenly found herself alone with Ivor. Not that she minded, of course, far from it, but she didn't like the idea that perhaps she was the victim of a put-up job. "'I do hope you'll be better to-morrow,' she said, and she commiserated with Anne on all she had missed. The garden, the stars, the scent of the flowers, the meteorites through whose summer shower the earth was now passing, the rising moon and its gibbosity. And then they had such interesting conversation. What about? About almost everything. Nature, art, science, poetry, the stars, spiritualism, the relations of the sexes, music, religion. Ivor, she thought, had an interesting mind. The two ladies parted affectionately. End of chapter. Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 18 The nearest Roman Catholic church was upwards of twenty miles away. Ivor, who was punctilious in his devotions, came down early to breakfast and had his car at the door ready to start by a quarter to ten. It was a smart, expensive-looking machine, enamelled a pure lemon yellow and upholstered in emerald green leather. There were two seats, three if you squeezed tightly enough, and their occupants were protected from wind, dust and weather by a glazed sedan that rose an elegant eighteenth-century hump from the midst of the body of the car. Mary had never been to a Roman Catholic service, thought it would be an interesting experience, and, when the car moved off through the great gates of the courtyard, she was occupying the spare seat in the sedan. The sea-lion horn roared, faintlier, faintlier, and they were gone. In the parish church of Crome, Mr. Bodium preached on 1 Kings 6, 18, and the cedar of the house within was carved with knobs. A sermon of immediately local interest. For the past two years, the problem of the war memorial had exercised the minds of all those in Crome who had enough leisure, or mental energy, or party spirit to think of such things. Henry Wimbush was all for a library, a library of local literature, stocked with county histories, old maps of the district, monographs on the local antiquities, dialect dictionaries, handbooks of the local geology and natural history. He liked to think of the villagers, inspired by such reading, making up parties of a Sunday afternoon to look for fossils and flint arrowheads. The villagers themselves favoured the idea of a memorial reservoir and water supply. But the busiest and most articulate party followed Mr. Bodium in demanding something religious in character, a second lichgate, for example, a stained-glass window, a monument of marble, or, if possible, all three. So far, however, nothing had been done, partly because the memorial committee had never been able to agree, partly for the more cogent reason that too little money had been subscribed to carry out any of the proposed schemes. Every three or four months Mr. Bodium preached a sermon on the subject. His last had been delivered in March. It was high time that his congregation had a fresh reminder. And the cedar of the house within was carved with knops. Mr. Bodiham touched lightly on Solomon's temple. From thence he passed to temples and churches in general. What were the characteristics of these buildings dedicated to God? Obviously the fact of their, from the human point of view, complete uselessness. They were unpractical buildings carved with knobs. Solomon might have built a library. Indeed, what could be more to the taste of the world's wisest man 
He might have dug a reservoir. What more useful in a parched city like Jerusalem? He did neither. He built a house, all carved with knots, useless and unpractical. Why? Because he was dedicating the work to God. There had been much talk in Crome about the proposed war memorial. A war memorial was, in its very nature, a work dedicated to God. It was a token of thankfulness that the first stage in the culminating world war had been crowned by the triumph of righteousness. It was, at the same time, a visibly embodied supplication that God might not long delay the advent which alone could bring the final peace. A library, a reservoir, Mr. Bodiam scornfully and indignantly condemned the idea. These were works dedicated to man, not to God. As a war memorial, they were totally unsuitable. A lich-gate had been suggested. This was an object which answered perfectly to the definition of a war memorial, a useless work dedicated to God and carved with knots. One lich-gate, it was true, already existed. But nothing would be easier than to make a second entrance into the courtyard, and a second entrance would need a second gate. Other suggestions had been made, stained-glass window, a monument of marble. Both these were admirable, especially the latter. It was high time that the war memorial was erected. It might soon be too late. At any moment, like a thief in the night, God might come. Meanwhile, a difficulty stood in the way. Funds were inadequate. All should subscribe according to their means. Those who had lost relations in the war might reasonably be expected to subscribe a sum equal to that which they would have had to pay in funeral expenses if the relative had died while at home. Further delay was disastrous. The war memorial must be built at once. He appealed to the patriotism and the Christian sentiments of all his hearers. Henry Wimbush walked home, thinking of the books he would present to the war memorial library, if ever it came into existence. He took the path through the fields. It was pleasanter than the road. At the first style, a group of village boys, loutish young fellows, all dressed in the hideous, ill-fitting black, which makes a funeral of every English Sunday and holiday, were assembled drearily guffawing as they smoked their cigarettes. They made way for Henry Wimbush, touching their caps as he passed. He returned their salute. His bowler and face were one in their unruffled gravity. In Sir Ferdinando's time, he reflected, in the time of his son, Sir Julius, these young men would have had their Sunday diversions even at Crome, remote and rustic Crome. There would have been archery, skittles, dancing, social amusements in which they would have partaken as members of a conscious community. Now they had nothing, nothing except Mr. Bodium's forbidding boys' club, and the rare dances and concerts organised by himself. Boredom, or the urban pleasures of the county metropolis, were the alternatives that presented themselves to these poor youths. Country pleasures were no more. They had been stamped out by the Puritans. In Manningham's diary for 1600, there was a queer passage, he remembered, a very queer passage. Certain magistrates in Berkshire, Puritan magistrates, had had wind of a scandal. One moonlit summer night they had ridden out with their posse, and there, among the hills, they had come upon a company of men and women dancing stark naked among the sheepcuts. The magistrates and their men had ridden their horses into the crowd. How self-conscious the poor people must suddenly have felt, how helpless without their clothes against armed and booted horsemen. The dancers were arrested, whipped, jailed, set in the stocks. The moonlight dance was never danced again. What old, earthy, panic right came to extinction here, he wondered. Who knows? Perhaps their ancestors had danced like this in the moonlight ages before Adam and Eve were so much as thought of. He liked to think so. And now it was no more. These weary young men, if they wanted to dance, would have to bicycle six miles to the town. The country was desolate, without life of its own, without indigenous pleasures. The pious magistrates had snuffed out forever a little happy flame that had burned from the beginning of time. And as on Tullia's tomb one lamp burned clear, unchanged for fifteen hundred year, he repeated the lines to himself, and was desolated to think of all the murdered past. End of chapter
Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 19 Henry Wimbush Long Cigar burned aromatically. The history of Chrome lay on his knee. Slowly he turned over the pages. I can't decide what episode to read to you tonight, he said thoughtfully. Sir Ferdinando's voyages are not without interest. Then, of course, there's his son, Sir Julius. It was he who suffered from the delusion that his perspiration engendered flies. It drove him finally to suicide. Or there's Sir Cyprian. He turned the pages more rapidly. Or Sir Henry or Sir George. No, I'm inclined to think that I won't read about any of these. "'But you must read something,' insisted Mr. Scogan, taking his pipe out of his mouth. "'I think I shall read about my grandfather,' said Henry Wimbush, "'and the events that led up to his marriage with the eldest daughter of the last Sir Ferdinando.' "'Good,' said Mr. Scogan. "'We're listening.' "'Before I begin reading,' said Henry Wimbush, looking up from the book and taking off the pince-nez which he had just fitted to his nose, "'before we begin,' I must say a few preliminary words about Sir Ferdinando, the last of the Lapiths. At the death of the virtuous and unfortunate Sir Hercules, Ferdinando found himself in possession of the family fortune, not a little increased by his father's temperance and thrift. He applied himself forthwith to the task of spending it, which he did in an ample and jovial fashion. By the time he was forty he had eaten and above all drunk and loved away about half his capital and would infallibly have soon got rid of the rest in the same manner, if he had not had the good fortune to become so madly enamoured of the rector's daughter as to make a proposal of marriage. The young lady accepted him, and, in less than a year, had become the absolute mistress of Crome and her husband. An extraordinary reformation made itself apparent in Sir Ferdinando's character. He grew regular and economical in his habits. He even became temperate, rarely drinking more than a bottle and a half of porter to sitting. The waning fortune of the Lapiths began once more to wax, and that in despite of the hard times, for Sir Ferdinando married in 1809, in the height of the Napoleonic Wars. A prosperous and dignified old age, cheered by the spectacle of his children's growth and happiness, for Lady Lapith had already borne him three daughters, and there seemed no good reason why she should not bear many more of them, and sons as well, a patriarchal decline into the family vault seemed now to be Sir Ferdinando's enviable destiny. But Providence willed otherwise. To Napoleon, cause already of such infinite mischief, was due, though perhaps indirectly, the untimely and violent death which put a period to this reformed existence. Sir Ferdinando, who was above all things a patriot, had adopted from the earliest days of the conflict with the French his own peculiar method of celebrating our victories. When the happy news reached London, it was his custom to purchase immediately a large store of liquor, and, taking a place on whichever of the outgoing coaches he happened to light upon first, to drive through the country, proclaiming the good news to all he met on the road, and dispensing it, along with the liquor, at every stopping place to all who cared to listen or drink. Thus, after the Nile, he had driven as far as Edinburgh and later, when the coaches, wreathed with laurel for triumph, with cypress for mourning, were setting out with the news of Nelson's victory and death, he sat through all a chilly October night on the box of the Norwich Meteor, with a nautical keg of rum on his knees and two cases of old brandy under the seat. This genial custom was one of the many habits which he abandoned on his marriage. The victories in the peninsula, the retreat from Moscow, Leipzig, and the abdication of the tyrant all went uncelebrated. It so happened, however, that in the summer of 1815, Sir Ferdinando was staying for a few weeks in the capital. There had been a succession of anxious, doubtful days. Then came the glorious news of Waterloo. It was too much for Sir Ferdinando. His joyous youth awoke again within him. He hurried to his wine merchant, and bought a dozen bottles of 1760 brandy. The bath coach was on the point of starting. He bribed his way onto the box, and, seated in glory beside the driver, proclaimed aloud the downfall of the Corsican bandit, and passed about the warm, liquid joy. They clattered through Uxbridge, Slough, Maidenhead. Sleeping Reading was awakened by the great news. 
At Didcot, one of the ostlers was so much overcome by patriotic emotions and the 1760 brandy that he found it impossible to do up the buckles of the harness. The night began to grow chilly, and Sir Ferdinando found that it was not enough to take a nip at every stage. To keep up his vital warmth, he was compelled to drink between the stages as well. They were approaching Swindon. The coach was travelling at a dizzy speed, six miles in the last half an hour, when, without having manifested the slightest premonitory symptoms of unsteadiness, Sir Ferdinando suddenly toppled sideways off his seat and fell head foremost into the road. An unpleasant jolt awakened the slumbering passengers. The coach was brought to a standstill. The guard ran back with a light. He found Sir Ferdinando still alive, but unconscious. Blood was oozing from his mouth. The back wheels of the coach had passed over his body, breaking most of his ribs and both arms. His skull was fractured in two places. They picked him up, but he was dead before they reached the next stage. So perished Sir Ferdinando, a victim of his own patriotism. Lady Lapith did not marry again, but determined to devote the rest of her life to the well-being of her three children, Georgiana, now five years old, and Emmeline and Caroline, twins of two. Henry Wimbush paused, and once more put on his pince-nez. So much by way of introduction, he said. Now I can begin to read about my grandfather. One moment, said Mr. Scogan, till I've refilled my pipe. Mr. Wimbush waited. Seated apart in a corner of the room, Ivor was showing Mary his sketches of spirit life. They spoke together in whispers. Mr. Scogan had lighted his pipe again. Fire away, he said. Henry Wimbush fired away. It was in the spring of 1833 that my grandfather, George Wimbush, first made acquaintance of the three lovely Lapiths, as they were always called. He was then a young man of twenty-two, with curly yellow hair, and a smooth pink face that was the mirror of his youthful and ingenuous mind. He had been educated at Harrow and Christchurch. He enjoyed hunting and all other field sports, and, though his circumstances were comfortable to the verge of affluence, his pleasures were temperate and innocent. His father, an East Indian merchant, had destined him for a political career and had gone to considerable expense in acquiring a pleasant little Cornish borough as a twenty-first birthday gift for his son. He was justly indignant when, on the very eve of George's majority, the Reform Bill of 1832 swept the borough out of existence. The inauguration of George's political career had to be postponed. At the time he got to know the lovely Lapiths, he was waiting. He was not at all impatient. The lovely Lapiths did not fail to impress him. Georgiana, the eldest, with her black ringlets, her flashing eyes, her noble aquiline profile, her swan-like neck and sloping shoulders, was orientally dazzling. And the twins, with their delicately turned-up noses, their blue eyes and chestnut hair, were an identical pair of ravishingly English charmers. Their conversation at this first meeting proved, however, to be so forbidding that— but for the invincible attraction exercised by their beauty, George would never have had the courage to follow up the acquaintance. The twins, looking up their noses at him with an air of languid superiority, asked him what he thought of the latest French poetry, and whether he liked the Indiana of George Chand. But what was almost worse was the question with which Georgiana opened her conversation with him. In music, she asked, leaning forward and fixing him with her large dark eyes, are you a classicist or a transcendentalist? George did not lose his presence of mind. He had enough appreciation of music to know that he hated anything classical. And so, with a promptitude which did him credit, he replied, I am a transcendentalist. Georgiana smiled bewitchingly. I am glad, she said, so am I. You went to hear the Paganini last week, of course. The prayer of Moses. Ah, she closed her eyes. Do you know anything more transcendental than that? No, said George, I don't. He hesitated, was about to go on speaking, and then decided that after all it would be wiser not to say, what was in fact true, that he had enjoyed above all Paganini's farmyard impressions. The man had made his fiddle bray like an ass, cluck like a hen, grunt, squeal, bark, neigh, quack, bellow and growl. 
that last item, in George's estimation, had almost compensated for the tediousness of the rest of the concert. He smiled with pleasure at the thought of it. Yes, decidedly, he was no classicist in music. He was a thoroughgoing transcendentalist. George followed up this first introduction by paying a call on the young ladies and their mother, who occupied during the season a small but elegant house in the neighbourhood of Berkeley Square. Lady Lapith made a few discreet inquiries, and, having found that George's financial position, character and family were all passably good, she asked him to dine. She hoped and expected that her daughters would all marry into the peerage, but, being a prudent woman, she knew it was advisable to prepare for all contingencies. George Wimbush, she thought, would make an excellent second string for one of the twins. At this first dinner, George's partner was Emmeline. They talked of nature. Emmeline protested that to her high mountains were a feeling, and the hum of human cities torture. George agreed that the country was very agreeable, but held that London during the season also had its charms. He noticed with surprise and a certain solicitous distress that Miss Emmeline's appetite was poor, that it didn't, in fact, exist. Two spoonfuls of soup, a morsel of fish, no bird, no meat, and three grapes. That was her whole dinner. He looked from time to time at her two sisters. Georgiana and Caroline seemed to be quite as abstemious. They waved away whatever was offered them with an expression of delicate disgust, shutting their eyes and diverting their faces from the proffered dish, as though the lemon sole, the duck, the loin of veal, the trifle, were objects revolting to the sight and smell. George, who thought the dinner capital, ventured to comment on the sisters' lack of appetite. "'Pray don't talk to me of eating,' said Emmeline, drooping like a sensitive plant. We find it so coarse, so unspiritual, my sisters and I. One can't think of one's soul while one is eating. George agreed one couldn't, but one must live, he said. Alas, Emmeline sighed, one must. Death is very beautiful, don't you think? She broke a corner off a piece of toast and began to nibble at it languidly. But since, as you say, one must live, she made a little gesture of resignation. Luckily, a very little suffices to keep one alive. She put down her corner of toast, half eaten. George regarded her with some surprise. She was pale, but she looked extraordinarily healthy, he thought. So did her sisters. Perhaps if you were really spiritual, you needed less food. He clearly was not spiritual. After this he saw them frequently. They all liked him, from Lady Lapith downwards. True, he was not very romantic or poetical, but he was such a pleasant, unpretentious, kind-hearted young man that one couldn't help liking him. For his part, he thought them wonderful, wonderful, especially Georgiana. He enveloped them all in a warm, protective affection. For they needed protection. They were altogether too frail, too spiritual for this world. They never ate. They were always pale. They often complained of fever. They talked much and lovingly of death. They frequently swooned. Georgiana was the most ethereal of all. Of the three she ate least, swooned most often, talked most of death, and was the palest, with a pallor that was so startling as to appear positively artificial. At any moment, it seemed, she might lose her precarious hold on this material world and become all spirit. To George the thought was a continual agony, if she were to die. She contrived, however, to live through the season, and that in spite of the numerous balls, routs, and other parties of pleasure which, in company with the rest of the lovely trio, she never failed to attend. In the middle of July the whole household moved down to the country. George was invited to spend the month of August at Crome. The house-party was distinguished. In the list of visitors figured the names of two marriageable young men of title. George had hoped that the country air, repose, and natural surroundings might have restored to the three sisters their appetites and the rose of their cheeks. He was mistaken. For dinner the first evening Georgiana ate only an olive, two or three salted almonds, and half a peach. She was as pale as ever. During the meal she spoke of love. True love, she said, being infinite and eternal, 
can only be consummated in eternity. Indiana and Sir Rodolph celebrated the mystic wedding of their souls by jumping into Niagara. Love is incompatible with life. The wish of two people who truly love one another is not to live together, but to die together. Come, come, my dear, said Lady Lapith, stout and practical. What would become of the next generation, pray, if all the world acted on your principles? Mamma, Georgiana protested, and dropped her eyes. In my young days, Lady Lapith went on, I should have been laughed out of countenance if I'd said a thing like that. But then, in my young days, souls weren't as fashionable as they are now, and we didn't think death was at all poetical. It was just unpleasant. Mamma, Emmeline and Caroline implored in unison. In my young days, Lady Lapith was launched into her subject. Nothing, it seemed, could stop her now. In my young days, if you didn't eat, people told you you needed a dose of rhubarb. Nowadays, there was a cry. Georgiana had swooned sideways on to Lord Timpany's shoulder. It was a desperate expedient, but it was successful. Lady Lapith was stopped. The days passed in an uneventful round of pleasures. Of all the gay party, George alone was unhappy. Lord Timpany was paying his court to Georgiana, and it was clear that he was not unfavourably received. George looked on, and his soul was a hell of jealousy and despair. The boisterous company of the young men became intolerable to him. He shrank from them, seeking gloom and solitude. One morning, having broken away from them on some vague pretext, he returned to the house alone. The young men were bathing in the pool below, their cries and laughter floated up to him, making the quiet house seem lonelier and more silent. The lovely sisters and their mamma still kept their chambers. They did not customarily make their appearance till luncheon, so that the male guests had the morning to themselves. George sat down in the hall and abandoned himself to thought. At any moment she might die, at any moment she might become Lady Timpany. It was terrible, terrible. If she died, then he would die too. He would go to seek her beyond the grave. If she became Lady Timpany, ah, then, the solution of the problem would not be so simple. If she became Lady Timpany, it was a horrible thought. But then suppose she were in love with Timpany, though it seemed incredible that anyone could be in love with Timpany. Suppose her life depended on Timpany. Suppose she couldn't live without him. He was fumbling his way along this clueless labyrinth of suppositions when the clock struck twelve. On the last stroke, like an automaton released by the turning clockwork, a little maid, holding a large covered tray, popped out of the door that led from the kitchen regions into the hall. From his deep arm chair, George watched her, himself it was evident unobserved, with an idle curiosity. She pattered across the room and came to a halt in front of what seemed a blank expanse of panelling. She reached out her hand, and, to George's extreme astonishment, a little door swung open, revealing the foot of a winding staircase. Turning sideways in order to get her tray through the narrow opening, the little maid darted in with a rapid, crab-like motion. The door closed behind her with a click. A minute later it opened again, and the maid, without her tray, hurried back across the hall and disappeared in the direction of the kitchen. George tried to recompose his thoughts, but an invincible curiosity drew his mind towards the hidden door, the staircase the little maid. It was in vain, he told himself, that the matter was none of his business, that to explore the secrets of that surprising door, that mysterious staircase within, would be a piece of unforgivable rudeness and indiscretion. It was in vain. For five minutes he struggled heroically with this curiosity, but at the end of that time he found himself standing in front of the innocent sheet of panelling through which the little maid had disappeared. A glance sufficed to show him the position of the secret door. Secret he perceived only to those who looked with a careless eye. It was just an ordinary door let in flush with the panelling. No latch nor handle betrayed its position, but an unobtrusive catch sunk in the wood invited the thumb. George was astonished that he had not noticed it before. Now he had seen it, it was so obvious, almost as obvious as the cupboard door in the library with its lines of imitation shelves and its dummy books. He pulled back the catch and peeped inside. 
the staircase of which the degrees were made not of stone but of blocks of ancient oak, wound up and out of sight. A slit-like window admitted the daylight. He was at the foot of the central tower, and the little window looked out over the terrace. They were still shouting and splashing in the pool below. George closed the door and went back to his seat. But his curiosity was not satisfied. Indeed, this partial satisfaction had but whetted his appetite. Where did the staircase lead? What was the errand of the little maid? It was no business of his, he kept repeating, no business of his. He tried to read, but his attention wandered. A quarter past twelve sounded on the harmonious clock. Suddenly determined, George rose, crossed the room, opened the hidden door, and began to ascend the stairs. He passed the first window, corkscrewed round, and came to another. He paused for a moment to look out. His heart beat uncomfortably, as though he were affronting some unknown danger. What he was doing, he told himself, was extremely ungentlemanly, horribly underbred. He tiptoed onward and upward. One more turn, then half a turn, and a door confronted him. He halted now before it, listened, he could hear no sound. Putting his eye to the keyhole, he saw nothing but a stretch of white sunlit wall. Emboldened, he turned the handle and stepped across the threshold. There he halted, petrified by what he saw, mutely gaping. In the middle of a pleasantly sunny little room, it is now Priscilla's boudoir, Mr. Wimbush remarked parenthetically, stood a small circular table of mahogany, Crystal, porcelain, and silver, all the shining apparatus of an elegant meal, were mirrored in its polished depths. The carcass of a cold chicken, a bowl of fruit, a great ham deeply gashed to its heart of tenderest white and pink, the brown cannon-ball of a cold plum pudding, a slender hot bottle, and a decanter of claret, jostled one another for a place on this festive board. And round the table sat the three sisters, the three lovely lapiths eating. At George's sudden entrance they had all looked towards the door, and now they sat petrified by the same astonishment which kept George fixed and staring. Georgiana, who sat immediately facing the door, gazed at him with dark, enormous eyes. Between the thumb and forefinger of her right hand she was holding a drumstick of the dismembered chicken. Her little finger, elegantly crooked, stood apart from the rest of her hand. Her mouth was open, but the drumstick had never reached its destination. It remained suspended, frozen, in mid-air. The other two sisters had turned round to look at the intruder. Caroline still grasped her knife and fork. Emmeline's fingers were round the stem of her claret-glass. For what seemed a very long time, George and the three sisters stared at one another in silence. They were a group of statues. Then, suddenly, there was movement. Georgiana dropped her chicken-bone. Caroline's knife and fork clattered on her plate. The movement propagated itself, grew more decisive. Emmeline sprang to her feet, uttering a cry. The wave of panic reached George. He turned and, mumbling something unintelligible as he went, rushed out of the room and down the winding stairs. He came to a standstill in the hall, and there, all by himself in the quiet house, he began to laugh. At luncheon it was noticed that the sisters ate a little more than usual. Georgiana toyed with some French beans and a spoonful of calf's foot jelly. "'I feel a little stronger today,' she said to Lord Timpany, when he congratulated her on this increase of appetite. "'A little more material,' she added with a nervous laugh. Looking up, she caught George's eye. A blush suffused her cheeks, and she looked hastily away. In the garden that afternoon they found themselves for a moment alone. "'You won't tell anyone, George. Promise you won't tell anyone,' she implored. "'It would make us look so ridiculous. And besides, eating is unspiritual, isn't it? Say you won't tell anyone.' "'I will,' said George brutally. "'I'll tell everyone, unless—' "'It's blackmail.' "'I don't care,' said George. "'I'll give you twenty-four hours to decide.' Lady Lapith was disappointed, of course. She'd hoped for better things, for timpani and a coronet. But George, after all, wasn't so bad— they were married at the new year. My poor grandfather, Mr. Wimbush added, as he closed his book and put away his pince-nez, 
Whenever I read in the papers about oppressed nationalities, I think of him. He relighted his cigar. It was a maternal government, highly centralised, and there were no representative institutions. Henry Wimbush ceased speaking. In the silence that ensued, Ivor's whispered commentary on the spirit sketches once more became audible. Priscilla, who had been dozing, suddenly woke up. What? she said in startled tones of one newly returned to consciousness. What? Jenny caught the words. She looked up, smiled, nodded reassuringly. It's about a ham, she said. What's about a ham? What Henry's been reading? She closed the red notebook lying on her knees and slipped a rubber band round it. I'm going to bed, she announced, and got up. So am I, said Anne, yawning. But she lacked the energy to rise from her armchair. The night was hot and oppressive. Round the open windows the curtains hung unmoving. Ivor, fanning himself with a portrait of an astral being, looked out into the darkness and drew a breath. The air's like wool, he declared. It will get cooler after midnight, said Henry Wimbush, and cautiously added, perhaps. I shan't sleep, I know. Priscilla turned her head in his direction. The monumental coiffure nodded exorbitantly at her slightest movement. "'You must make an effort,' she said. "'When I can't sleep, I concentrate my will. I say, I will sleep, I am asleep, and pop, off I go. That's the power of thought.' "'But does it work on stuffy nights?' Ivor inquired. "'I simply cannot sleep on a stuffy night.' "'Nor can I,' said Mary, "'except out of doors.' "'Out of doors! What a wonderful idea!' In the end they decided to sleep on the towers, Mary on the western tower, Ivor on the eastern. There was a flat expanse of leads on each of the towers, and you could get a mattress through the trap doors that opened onto them. Under the stars, under the gibbous moon, assuredly they would sleep. The mattresses were hauled up, sheets and blankets were spread, and an hour later the two insomniasts, each on his separate tower, were crying their good nights across the dividing gulf. On Mary the sleep-compelling charm of the open air did not work with its expected magic. Even through the mattress one could not fail to be aware that the leads were extremely hard. Then there were noises, the owls screeched tirelessly, and once, roused by some unknown terror, all the geese of the farmyard burst into a sudden frenzy of cackling. The stars and the gibbous moon demanded to be looked at, and when one meteorite had streaked across the sky, you could not help waiting, open-eyed and alert, for the next. Time passed. The moon climbed higher and higher in the sky. Mary felt less sleepy than she had when she first came out. She sat up and looked over the parapet. Had Ivor been able to sleep, she wondered. And, as though in answer to her mental question, from behind the chimney-stack, at the farther end of the roof, a white form noiselessly emerged, a form that, in the moonlight, was recognisably Ivor's. Spreading his arms to right and left like a tightrope dancer, he began to walk forward along the roof-tree of the house. He swayed terrifyingly as he advanced. Mary looked on speechlessly. Perhaps he was walking in his sleep. Suppose he were to wake up suddenly now. If she spoke or moved, it might mean his death. She dared look no more, but sank back into her pillows. She listened intently. For what seemed an immensely long time, there was no sound. Then there was a patter of feet on the tiles, followed by a scrabbling noise and a whispered, Damn! And suddenly Ivor's head and shoulders appeared above the parapet. One leg followed, and then the other. He was on the leads. Mary pretended to wake up with a start. Oh, she said, what are you doing here? I couldn't sleep, he explained, and so I came along to see if you couldn't. One gets bored by oneself on a tower. Don't you find it so? It was light before five. Long, narrow clouds barred the east, their edges bright with orange fire. The sky was pale and watery. With a mournful scream of a soul in pain, a monstrous peacock, flying heavily up from below, alighted on the parapet of the tower. Ivor and Mary started broad awake. "'Catch him!' cried Ivor, jumping up. "'We'll have a feather.' The frightened peacock ran up and down the parapet in an absurd distress, curtsying and bobbing and clucking. His long tail swung ponderously back and forth as he turned and turned again. Then, with a flap and a swish, he launched himself upon the air and sailed magnificently earthward with a recovered dignity. 
but he had left the trophy. Ivor had his feather, a long lashed eye of purple and green, of blue and gold. He handed it to his companion. An angel's feather, he said. Mary looked at it for a moment, gravely and intently. Her purple pyjamas clothed her with an ampleness that hid the lines of her body. She looked like some large, comfortable, unjointed toy, a sort of teddy bear, but a teddy bear with an angel's head, pink cheeks, and hair like a bell of gold. An angel's face, the feather of an angel's wing, somehow the whole atmosphere of this sunrise was rather angelic. "'It's extraordinary to think of sexual selection,' she said at last, looking up from her contemplation of the miraculous feather. "'Extraordinary,' Ivor echoed. "'I select you, you select me. What luck!' He put his arm around her shoulder, and they stood looking eastward. The first sunlight had begun to warm and colour the pale light of the dawn. Mauve pyjamas and white pyjamas, they were a young and charming couple. The rising sun touched their faces. It was all extremely symbolic. But then, if you chose to think so, nothing in this world is not symbolical. Profound and beautiful truth. "'I must be getting back to my tower,' said Ivor at last. "'Already? I'm afraid so. The varletry will soon be up and about. Ivor!' There was a prolonged and silent farewell. "'And now,' said Ivor, "'I repeat my tightrope stunt.' Mary threw her arms round his neck. "'You mustn't, Ivor. It's dangerous. Please.' He had to yield at last to her entreaties. "'All right,' he said. "'I'll go down through the house and up at the other end.' He vanished through the trap-door into the darkness that still lurked within the shuttered house. A minute later he had reappeared on the farther tower. He waved his hand and then sank down out of sight behind the parapet. From below, in the house, came the thin, wasp-like buzzing of an alarm clock. He had gone back just in time. End of chapter Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 20 Ivor was gone. Lounging behind the windscreen in his yellow sedan, he was whirling across rural England. Social and amorous engagements of the most urgent character called him from hall to baronial hall, from castle to castle, from Elizabethan manor house to Georgian mansion, over the whole expanse of the kingdom. Today in Somerset, tomorrow in Warwickshire, and on Saturday in the West Riding. By Tuesday morning in Argyll, Ivor never rested. The whole summer through, from the beginning of July till the end of September, he devoted himself to his engagements. He was a martyr to them. In the autumn he went back to London for a holiday. Crome had been a little incident, an evanescent bubble on the stream of his life. It belonged already to the past. By tea-time he would be at Gobley, and there would be Zenobia's welcoming smile. And on Thursday morning, but that was a long, long way ahead. He would think of Thursday morning when Thursday morning arrived. Meanwhile there was Gobley, meanwhile Zenobia. In the visitor's book at Crome, Ivor had left, according to his invariable custom in these cases, a poem. He had improvised it magisterially in the ten minutes preceding his departure. Dennis and Mr. Scogan strolled back together from the gates of the courtyard, whence they had bidden their last farewells. On the writing-table in the hall they found a visitor's book open, and Ivor's composition scarcely dry. Mr. Scogan read it aloud. The magic of those immemorial kings who webbed enchantment on the bowls of night sleeps in the soul of all created things. In the blue sea, the Acrosoronian height, in the eyed butterfly's auricular wings, and orgied visions of the anchorite. In all that singing flies and flying sings, in rain, in pain, in delicate delight. But much more magic, much more cogent spells, weave here their wizardries about my soul. Chrome calls me like the voice of vesperal bells, haunts like a ghostly peopled necropole. Fate tears me hence, hard fate, since far from Chrome my soul must weep remembering its home. "'Very nice and tasteful and tactful,' said Mr. Scogan, when he had finished. "'I am only troubled by the butterfly's auricular wings.' 
You have a first-hand knowledge of the workings of a poet's mind, Dennis. Perhaps you can explain. What could be simpler, said Dennis. It's a beautiful word, and Ivor wanted to say that the wings were golden. You make it luminously clear. One suffers so much, Dennis went on, from the fact that beautiful words don't always mean what they ought to mean. Recently, for example, I had a whole poem ruined just because the word carminative didn't mean what it ought to have meant. Carminative. It's admirable, isn't it? Admirable, Mr. Scogan agreed. And what does it mean? It's a word I've treasured from my earliest infancy, said Dennis. Treasured and loved. They used to give me cinnamon when I had a cold. Quite useless, but not disagreeable. One poured it drop by drop out of narrow bottles, a golden liquor, fierce and fiery. On the label was a list of its virtues, and among other things it was described as being, in the highest degree, carminative. I adore the word. Isn't it carminative, I used to say to myself, when I'd taken my dose. It seems so wonderfully to describe that sensation of internal warmth, that glow, that, what shall I call it, physical self-satisfaction, which followed the drinking of cinnamon. Later, when I discovered alcohol, Carminative described for me that similar but nobler, more spiritual glow which wine evokes, not only in the body but in the soul as well. The carminative virtues of Burgundy, of rum, of old brandy, of lacryma Christi, of Marsala, of Aliatico, of stout, of gin, of champagne, of claret, of the raw new wine of this year's Tuscan vintage, I compared them, I classified them. Marsala is rosily, downily carminative. Gin pricks and refreshes while it warms. I had a whole table of carmination values. And now, Dennis spread out his hands, palms upwards, despairingly, now I know what carminative really means. Well, what does it mean? asked Mr. Scogan a little impatiently. Carminative, said Dennis, lingering lovingly over the syllables. Carminative. I imagined vaguely that it had something to do with carmen carminis, still more vaguely with caro carnis, and its derivations like carnival and carnation. Carminative, there was the idea of singing and the idea of flesh, rose-coloured and warm, with a suggestion of the jollities of Micarem and the masked holidays of Venice. Carminative, the warmth, the glow, the interior ripeness were all in the word, instead of which. Do come to the point, my dear Dennis, protested Mr. Scogan. Do come to the point. Well, I wrote a poem the other day, said Dennis. I wrote a poem about the effects of love. Others have done the same before you, said Mr. Scogan. There is no need to be ashamed. I was putting forward the notion, Dennis went on, that the effects of love were often similar to the effects of wine, that Eros could intoxicate as well as Bacchus. Love, for example, is essentially carminative. It gives one the sense of warmth, the glow, and passion, carminative as wine, was what I wrote. Not only was the line elegantly sonorous, it was also, I flattered myself, very aptly, compendiously expressive. Everything was in the word carminative, a detailed, exact foreground, an immense, indefinite hinterland of suggestion, and passion carminative as wine. I was not ill-pleased. And then suddenly it occurred to me that I had never actually looked up the word in a dictionary. Carminative had grown up with me from the days of the cinnamon bottle. It had always been taken for granted. Carminative, for me, the word was as rich in content as some tremendous, elaborate work of art. It was a complete landscape with figures. And passion, carminative as wine, it was the first time I had ever committed the word to writing, and all at once I felt I would like lexicographical authority for it. A small English-German dictionary was all I had at hand. I turned up C, ka, ka, calm. There it was, carminative, vintreibend. Vintreibend, he repeated. Mr. Scogan laughed. Dennis shook his head. Ah, he said, for me it was no laughing matter. For me it marked the end of a chapter, the death of something young and precious. There were the years, years of childhood and innocence, when I had believed that carminative meant, well, carminative. And now, before me lies the rest of my life, a day, perhaps ten years, half a century, when I shall know that carminative means vintreibend. Plus ne suis ce que j'ai été, et ne le saurai jamais être. It is a realisation that makes one rather melancholy. Carminative, said Mr. Scogan thoughtfully. Carminative, Dennis repeated, and they were silent for a time. 
"'Words,' said Dennis at last, "'words, I wonder if you can realise how much I love them. "'You are too much preoccupied with mere things and ideas and people "'to understand the full beauty of words. "'Your mind is not a literary mind. "'The spectacle of Mr. Gladstone finding thirty-four rhymes to the name Margot "'seems to you rather pathetic than anything else. "'Madame's envelopes with their versified addresses leave you cold, "'unless they leave you pitiful.' You can't see that. Apt à ne point te cabrer, hué post et j'ajouterai dia, si tu ne fuis onze bi rue Balzac, chez cette hérédia, is a little miracle. You're right, said Mr. Scogan. I can't. You don't feel it to be magical? No. That's the best test of the literary mind, said Dennis. The feeling of magic, the sense that words have power. The technical, verbal part of literature is simply a development of magic. Words are man's first and most grandiose invention. With language he created a whole new universe. What wonder if he loved words and attributed power to them. With fitted, harmonious words the magicians summoned rabbits out of empty hats and spirits from the elements. Their descendants, the literary men, still go on with the process morticing their verbal formulas together, and, before the power of the finished spell, trembling with delight and awe. Rabbits out of empty hats? No, their spells are more subtly powerful, for they evoke emotions out of empty minds. Formulated by their art, the most insipid statements become enormously significant. For example, I proffer the constatation, black ladders lack bladders. A self-evident truth, one on which it would not have been worth while to insist had I chosen to formulate it in such words as black fire escapes have no bladders or les échelles noires manquant de vessie. But I put it as I do, black ladders lack bladders. It becomes, for all its self-evidence, significant, unforgettable, moving. The creation by word power of something out of nothing. What is that but magic? And, I may add, what is that but literature? Half the world's greatest poetry is simply Les Echelles Noires Manque des Vessies, translated into magic significance as Black Ladders Lack Bladders, and you can't appreciate words. I'm sorry for you. A mental carminative, said Mr. Scogan reflectively. That's what you need. End of chapter.